Ça... We just saw and listened to Karen Palacio and Pablo Riera doing live coding of visuals and music. Live coding is an experiment creative practice that combines creative programming with sound and visual performance. As the code is written, the sound and images are created, producing real-time artistic narratives. The code is projected as part of the performance and as a way to share knowledge. All of this combined created the artistical experience for us all to be part of. For this performance, they used footage of kipus, data centers, medical images, and voices made with artificial intelligence in real time. So, welcome everybody, and now we are having some words of Pablo, one of the organizers of Kipu, and one of the guys that make this happen. So, thank you very much. Pablo. Hola a todos, bienvenidos al evento de cierre de Kipu 2023. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the closing event of Kipu 2023. Uh, we thank you all for being here and joining us this afternoon. Uh, Kipu uh, is hard to believe that Kipu is ending. We had an amazing week so far. Uh, we wanted for our closing event to open it up a bit to the community and, and the society. So before we start, we are going to share a few words with you. Uh, first of all, we are here at the beautiful Teatro Solís de Montevideo. We want to thank Intendencia de Montevideo for their support and also for making this possible. We want to give a special thanks to Universidad de la República and Facultad de Ingeniería for hosting us once again in person uh, and making this event possible. Uh, Universidad de la República is and has been the house for many of us. Many of our speakers and organizers have studied here. Many of them have come from abroad. Some of them are professors and have brought their students of their own uh, for them to experience this week and be at, the, uh, at our beautiful Facultad de Ingeniería. Um, we also want to thank our generous sponsors. They are the ones that make this possible. Uh, sponsors and partners, I have to say. So we are really proud to have all sides of the AI ecosystem represented in our sponsorship. We have from the industry well-established companies from the local region as well as the international scene. We have very promising AI startups and in the academic sector, not only represented by Universidad de la República. We also are happy to have support by the government. All right, just to quickly tell you what uh, Kipu is about. It started as an initiative by local and uh, by Latin American researchers, both from the region and from abroad. The goal of Kipu are to help build the AI community by fostering collaborations in Latin America. We also want to bring free advanced training in both machine learning and AI. And finally, we want to help build awareness on how AI can be used to benefit Latin America and the world. One thing we like, we like to say is that we want to answer the questions of what can AI do for Latin America and what can Latin America do for AI? All right, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of what just happened this week. As I said before, it's hard to believe it is over uh, or, or is, get, is closing. <laughs> So we had 200 students from 13 Latin American countries and 18 countries if we can't count the rest of the world. We hosted 60 researchers and professors from the region and 20 coming from abroad. Uh, we hosted many lectures and research talks. We also had, have, uh, sorry, we also had code labs uh, with cut, uh, hands, to provide hands-on experience on cutting-edge technology as well as uh, practical sessions. We also hosted roundtables and discussion sessions. This year, Kipu had some satellite events. Uh, in particular, Chicas TIC is an event that was co-organized by Facultad Ingeniería, Kipu, and Seibal. Finally, last night, we had our Women in AI event at Kibon. Uh, we had the surprise that 
the band no te va a gustar was a, a strategic partner of ours uh, and we're very happy that they believe in our mission and supported us. I have to say that it was really hard to be there in the morning, but, <laughs> but we suffered happily. All right, I don't want to take more time from our amazing uh, session. We're going to start by hearing some stories from Latin America. We're going to hear from Nina Daora, Ivan Mesa Ruiz, and Martin Rocamora. Following this, we're going to have AI stories from abroad with Nando de Freitas, Sarah Hooker, and Kunyun Cho. Then we have our keynote by Peter Norvig, followed by a panel on fostering AI in Latin America. In the panel, we're going to have Peter Norvig, Fabricio Scolini, Jocelyn Dunstan, and Sebastian Barrios. The moderator will be our very own Luciana Benotti. So many of you, all right, suspense. Okay, so many of you might be wondering what is a kipu. The attendants of kipu already know, but uh, I'm not going uh, to introduce this and explain what a kipu is. We're going to have Omar Flores, who's a researcher from Peru, living in the United States, of one and one of our co-organizers. All right, Omar is not here. <laughs> so, I wonder, I wonder if I should tell it or should we wait and do whatever you want. Should I tell it or? <laughs> this is the Kipu. Uh, so, so kipus were these absolutely fantastic devices for recording information and uh, actually also doing computation. Uh, they, they, they were used by many Andean uh, cultures. Omar actually brought this as a present for us in 2019. His family from a, a village close to Cusco uh, it provided it. And Essentially, the way it works is you use nodes to sort of store digitally information, kind of like a, an abacus or, or, or something of the sort. They were used for, as very powerful tools for communication and also for uh, storing information. Um, yeah, if you want, we're going to leave it here. You can come and see it. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, without further ado, I'll, have, uh, I'll leave you with our first speaker. Again, thank you so much for being here. So, now we are going to hear some AI stories from Latin America. The first presenter will be Ivan Vladimir Mesa Ruiz. He is an associate researcher at the Computer Science Department of the Research Institute in Applied Math and Systems of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He studied computer engineering at UNAM and has a master's degree and PhD degrees at the University of Edinburgh. He specialized in natural language processing, artificial intelligence and robotics. He is the author of over 100 publications in journals, congresses, workshops and reports. He is also a member of the national research given by the Mexican Council of Research. Recently, he's been working on machine translation and speech recognition systems for Mexican indigenous languages and the use of AI in Mexico, outlining a path of ethical committees for AI projects. So please welcome Ivan Vladimir Mesa Ruiz. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to start, at, as we have been doing through the event, uh, thanking the organizers. Uh, they have done a great job, and they have put a lot of effort. So uh, thank you again to the organizers of KIPU. I'm particularly triple thanks, thanks to them 
feels for organizing. Second, because yesterday I was able to tell uh, a little bit of another st uh, story about AI in, in, in my lab. And now I want to, to tell you another story, a story that I've been uh, uh, living. Uh, it's a difficult story because it's a complicate, uh, complicated uh, work uh, that, that we do. Uh, yesterday, yesterday also, uh, Paola Riquelme was, was uh, explaining us that uh, we had to, uh, to think on the communities that we work with and how our, our system impacts. And this work is we, we face the communities uh, uh, all the time and we see uh, how excited are, are they are on using the technology, but uh, they are also uh, worried about what is going to happen. So I, I want to, to tell this, this story a little bit. Um, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not a, a speaker uh, of an original language from the Americas, so I'm going to take an approach of an, of an outsider. That means that there is uh, another side of stories, uh, uh, maybe several stories, that in the future uh, you, you need to look and, and hear which is these communities uh, explaining why they need these, these, uh, these systems. Uh, I'm going to, as, as I see it, as an as a external researcher, uh, we have a problem of digital citizenship. Uh, language technologies, uh, right now, they are part of a linguistic technologic experience that we, have, that we take advantage. I see that with, with my students, that now they are reading papers written in English, they read it in Spanish, thanks to machine translation systems. Uh, last year uh, in Seattle, uh, I was one, with one uh, colleague, uh, and he was, uh, the, he, he was the one who called uh, Moses, it's a, a machine translation uh, part which was very important in the 2010s, and I was telling him that story, that I have students that they read papers in English, uh, that are, but they read in Spanish, and we can have conversations about the content, and uh, they, they understand the papers, they understand the ideas. So it's, it's, a, it's a privilege that we have now, uh, the speakers of Spanish, that we can do that. Uh, so this experience that my students are having, uh, they, they should be available for everyone, not, not only for, for, for a Spanish speaker. In this talk, uh, we are going to focus on the indigenous language of the Americas. Uh, it's interesting that uh, it also yesterday we were talking about uh, to going back to human rights, and it's interesting that uh, uh, human rights are there from the beginning, uh, talking about language. This is the second, second article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, we, can say, we can see Eleanor Roosevelt, which was the head of the committee that uh, uh, wrote the, the, the declaration. We can see uh, one year later, she's appreciating a printing of the, of the human rights. And in the second article is language. Uh, it's mentioned language, which when I found out, I, I, I feel very, very happy that it, it, it's recognized what we do uh, when, when, we talk with, when we work with language technology. But also, I feel responsible now, no? It's, it's there for us. Uh, more recently, in the fifth article of the UNESCO, the Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, they are more specific about all persons have, therefore, the right to express themselves and to create and disseminate their work in the language of their choice and particularly in their mother tongue. So again, it is a, a big responsibility that we carry, the people that, are working, that we are working in, in language. Uh, which uh, technology we want in, in all the languages? Uh, I will say all of them. Uh, we want, uh, there is a lot of work that has been done in input-output methods for interactions with devices. Uh, particularly, this is a prolific work, uh, prolific field for the, uh, the 
indigenous persons that are tech savvy. One of the things that they were refers is how to input uh, their uh, language in the mobile devices. Uh, we need also work on optical character recognitions because there are some texts that are, uh, that are in, 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 in these languages, but it's in, it's in, in all books and we have to, to work on recognizing and dealing. There is also a lot of work that has been done on this. We all also need the, the assistance that we, need, we get now with grammar and orthography when we are writing our documents. We also want that for, for the indigenous languages. Uh, we need autonomous machine translation, uh, speech technologies, and soon we need also conversational agents that can speak, uh, uh, that can have a conversation in these languages. Uh, recently, because everyone is talking about chat GPT, recently, I can tell you this experience, recently I asked them uh, to translate some text, uh, just a simple hello. The system respond, respond to me very confident, but the translation was not uh, real, no? It looked like they could be words, but they were not. So we need to work. Uh, when we work in this, in this field, there are certain topics that, that come, or certain motivations. As I say, I believe that we should support the citizen, digital citizenship, but there are works that also focus on what I call the axis of access. I make it difficult for me, sorry. So, uh, there is uh, a lot of work to bring the system to get access to just justice, which is a, a big problem, uh, to help, uh, uh, to have access to, to doctors and to have access to a, a, just a simple uh, consult with the doctor and that, that, that is meaningful for them. Uh, a, a colleague, he proposes to have access to readership because uh, the kids uh, don't have uh, the stories that we read and that we now in this global society that we have access. They don't have it in their, in their language. So they have to, to uh, use Spanish and they, they, they don't, don't learn to read in their, in their language. Also, uh, we, we need to promote the access to corners for, for these uh, communities. Uh, how, is, uh, how are the language of Americas? Uh, we have a thousand languages in the region uh, and they are organizing in a hundred family. We have a, a, a big richness in the, in the, in the area. Oh, for some cases we had, so we're going to see this now. So we have languages that are spoken by millions, 200 thousands of speakers. Those are, those are languages which are very alive. Uh, Guarani is one of the, uh, the, of the examples that, that you, you know about it a lot. Uh, then you have some language which are in the thousands or to the hundreds of speakers. These are complicated cases. Uh, we, can, uh, we can do something there. There are uh, people uh, working on preserving those languages. Then we have the critical endangered languages where we have only 10 of speakers. Uh, tens of speakers uh, for those languages. And those are complicated, complicated cases. So I want to bring your attention to this movie. This is a Mexican movie, Sueño en Otro Idioma. It's a, a version of something that happened. Uh, in Mexico, we have a language which is called a Japaneco. Uh, they have uh, in the tens of uh, speakers, particularly one variant, it had only two speakers in a town in Veracruz, and unfortunately, these speakers fight, and they were not talking to each other for a long time. <laughs> so this brings us back that we are, uh, we are uh, in a project that is about people. So it's, it's very important. This is a, a, it's not this, they change a little bit the story, they make it more uh, uh, movie friendly, but I, I recommend it a lot. And we have languages which are dormant. That means that we have some uh, information about them. We, maybe someone, if we read these grammars, if we read, read some literature, can, can learn it and bring, it, bring them back. Uh, that's a, a possibility. And we have a lot of extinct or mentioned languages. We know that uh, some 
they, they disappear. There are no more speakers. That happened in our, in our era. And we have other language that we find, literature, that they mention, but we, don't, we never uh, have the chance to, to register them. Uh, not all of the languages, not all of the original languages of Mexico originated in the Americas. Uh, we have a lot of uh, cases of mixed language, or also they are called pidgin languages. Uh, particular, particularly, you can think on uh, Jamaican Patua. I bring that because my wife is for, from Jamaica, so I, I, I heard a lot of Patua in my house. And it's, uh, it's this mixture of languages that become a new language. A new language. Uh, also, we have to consider the sign languages. Uh, there are a lot of sign languages associated to original languages from, from America. Uh, so, at the beginning, uh, uh, we did a, uh, a reflection about these challenges, and five years ago, we found that there was a linguistic ch uh, challenge because there is a lot of richness of the, of the languages. For instance, in Mexico, we have tonal languages that uh, base the their speech on chains of tones, but we have also languages that uh, make, uh, use a lot of uh, morphology and build uh, big uh, words. And it's very interesting that we have, it, we have them in the same uh, area. Uh, we have one other challenge is that there is a lot of digital resources. We don't have too many resources for, for these languages. I would say it's an extreme low digital resources case. We don't have uh, enough resources sometimes to create a, a, a technology around this. And something that, that we learned uh, soon is that se several of them are uh, oral languages. I'm going to uh, present more a, a, a bit. What have been we doing? We have been doing, working on automatic machine translation in our lab. We have a, a demos of these, uh, of these systems, uh, Birarica, Ayuk, Purepecha, Nyatro, Nahuatl, Mexicanero, and Jorin Jor Noki. Uh, this machine translation work to demonstrate that it's possible, but uh, they are not uh, good systems because we don't have enough data to train it. Uh, and the lab also, uh, through a student, did a lot of uh, work on revitalization. This is an important effort. Uh, in particular, what has happened in our lab is that uh, indigenous or, uh, students that come from indigenous communities or they are descendants from, from communities, they have arrived, they're interested in technology, they are doing a technology oriented uh, career, and they uh, choose to come to our lab, and they have a debt with their communities, and they uh, develop uh, the systems. It has worked very well, because uh, once they understand how uh, deep learning works, how we have to collect the data, they go to their communities, and they talk to their communities, and they explain uh, and they learn also a lot of their communities, how their communities are organized, who is going to provide the data, who is not going to provide it, which uh, sometimes they tell, them, they tell them, you can have the data, but you're not going to be able to publish it. You just train your model and see what happens, but uh, I don't want the, the data to be available. So it's, it's very interesting. Through this project, we have found new challenges uh, in, the, in the Mexican context. Uh, First, uh, governments haven't been supportive in, in all fronts. It's, it has been tough to convince the governments to, to look at this, but uh, we have only got one grant from the, our university for, for, for advancing these, uh, these ideas. Uh, another problem that we have found is that language don't have to be written, as I told you. Uh, a lot of language are uh, spoken, oral, and it, that we are moving to a speech now. In, in our lab, we, we are going to be working uh, in a speech for the language which are oral. The re revitalization efforts are particularly uh, difficult because uh, we have to bring the systems to the communities. The communities have to test uh, the tools that we create. And there is a lot of people working on revitalization. So we are part of an of a equation that had to work to keep uh, teaching these languages. Uh, there is a valorization of the languages that we were not aware. Uh, speakers uh, uh, pay attention to Spanish uh, uh, because 
It's going to give them access to education. It's going to give them access to health. It's going to give them access to justice. So uh, uh, they choose to speak more Spanish than, than the languages. So we have to revert that. In, and it's not a work that we can do. Uh, it's a work that we have to do with a lot of uh, uh, interdisciplinary efforts. Uh, we, we need to work with linguists, which have been uh, reaching these communities for a long time, with anthropologists sociologists as well. Uh, speakers rightfully don't trust the, this uh, situation, uh, that some of them get excited, but once that they know that we are going to take some data, they don't trust, and we have to create a link of trust. We have been doing it through the students, that, 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 that they have the link, but this, this has, somehow we have to change, and it doesn't, it's not uh, about a machine translation project, it's about a uh, changing a society, so it's, sometimes it's overwhelming. Uh, we have seen the language move. A lot of uh, indigenous uh, speakers in Mexico, they have moved to the United States, and they are speaking the language in the United States. So that's something new that is just recently happened. Uh, uh, it's very interesting for us. As I told you, some language fight, like in the case of the Ayapaneco, and sometimes language collide, and new uh, forms of, of, of language uh, happen. So I'm going to leave you some resources if you are interested in working on this. Uh, we have a workshop which has been uh, very good on, on putting us all together. It's a very friendly workshop. It's, not, uh, it's, ab it's about the natural language processing, but uh, we want to bring all the community that is interested in indigenous language. We want them to bring them together. Uh, we have a... a a list of resources in this GitHub page. And particularly, I want to bring attention to the work in Guarani that uh, Universidad de la República is doing. Uh, uh, Luis Chiruso and Santiago Gongora, they are the ones that I know that are working on this, but they are working with a team in Paraguay. So if you see them uh, sat in the, in the uh, halls, uh, you know they are facing a lot of challenges, so you can get close. And, try to help them to cheer them up. Uh, that's all I, I want to tell, talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. <clears throat> now we are having Nina Daora. She identifies herself as an anti-racist hacker. Passionate for science, Nina has a BS in computer science from PUC Rio and researches fairness and ethics in AA. She has a YouTube channel called Computasao da Hora, where she disseminates computer education. And she has also a podcast called Onguñe, where she interviews great scientists, mainly building bridges between the African continent and Brazil in the area of hard sciences. Nisa, Nina is also a teacher because teaching is in her family's blood and roots. Always researching the relations between algorithms and society, ethics AI, data privacy, and disseminating science education. Nina is also a developer certified by Apple Developer Academy and columnist for Mid Technology Review in Brazil. Recent, recently, she has joined the TikTok Brazil Security Advisory Council, where she collaborates with discussions on subjects such as content policies, safety strategies, and product launches. Please welcome Nina Daora. <laughs> Obrigada, amigos. Thank you, friends. Hi, hola, hola. Um, first, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Sandra and Luciana. Um, I'm hating English, but I will speak in English. Okay, but I have a support in my cell phone. So I will present my research, actually. Decolonize algorithms and artificial intelligence um, from a Brazil perspective, because it's different. Decolonize in AI from United States and the other the other countries from Brazil. So my focus is trying to investigate um, algorithmic races in facial recognition. So facial recognition is a big problem in Brazil, 
and in the other countries, but my focus in this moment is investigating this problem in Brazil. Um, I prepared a small presentation, because it's a small presentation, <laughs> <laughs> and divide uh, the, the introduction. It's an overview of the need for the colonization in algorithm in AI, impact of the colonialism on technology and data, and the importance of the diverse perspectives in the development of algorithms. So, to start this, I needed to present the, these three black Brazilians, thinkers and scientists who have, who have helped me to reflect and rethink um, possible paths to, to con development new tools in the AI. So, Beatriz Nascimento is a, was a philosopher and social scientist that in, in 20th century, who map, mapped the problems about um, the... How can I say this in English? So, you see, guys, I hate English because of this. But Beatriz Nascimento created a map about the problem with the lack of black academics in our universities. Milton Nascimento shared a new perspective of globalization and a new way to think globalization without colonialism in Brazil. And Lélia Gonzalez presented us with important concepts um, about how, how creating new strategies to organize the black movement in Afro-diasporic. -di so I needed to present these three persons, these black scientists, because in my research, before creating codes or, and before learning with a computer scientist, I learned with these guys. So, okay, Sandra, Sandra is here. Yeah. Nowadays, we have three and more and more and more black scientists in computer science that using the concepts that created and I, I presented um, before in computer science. So, Sandra, you know Sandra? Yeah? Okay. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have presentation. But Sandra and Fernanda uh, is my friends too, okay? And the, the two persons have a research about how to use computer vision in health and how to think computer vision uh, to uh, develop new benefits in health. So it is important to research. And Rosie is my colleague in ThoughtWorks. And Rosie thinking about how to create new ways to input more emerging technologies in our society. Um, okay, I will finish. But before, this, this phrase is important because in computer science we have a difficult to discuss about colonialism, about imperialism, about how these concepts and these, these things impact our work. So before, in, before investigating the codes of facial recognition technologies and tools, I, I create a a methodology to study more about photography, analogical and digital photography, before I studied facial recognition and this method in computer vision. I started to think how, what's the history about the data? What's the history about the image? I have, I have a, a, a joke. When you close your eyes and think about 
the in a beautiful person or in a beautiful face? What's your answer? Many of people answered about a white woman. This is this is a real um, and important research about our imagination before AI. What? Um, how our imaginations impact our development discourse about AI. So I will return it because I compare photography methodologies, analogical and digital, and the methods in facial recognition. After this, I studied some impact or, or better, some historical impacts in the black population here, there in Brazil, not in, in Latin America. And now I'm thinking about what's, the, what's the, our responsibility in this mitigation. I like this word. It's a word in English that I like, it, mitigation. <laughs> because it's possible. Mitigate something is possible. It's a, a good way to, to solution problems in AI. So, photography, health, and facial recognition have a methods, a closed methods, closed relations in your, in your action. But photographers and coders don't have a conversation. It's difficult. It's difficult. These are different languages, a different um, approach. But in the same time, have um, have same same actions to 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 solve problems in this situation. So, okay, this is very 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 very. It's matter. <laughs> I, I I'm using glasses, guys. But so. My current question is, is it possible to decolonize our imagination to decolonize AI? So it's different to decolonize AI. Decolonize images and data refer to the process of the talent and transform the ways in which images have historically been used to reinforce and perpetuate colonial power structures. This first phrase is important because before try to create these uh, databases or di diverse in databases, databases, we needed to rethink about colonial power structures. Come on, guys, we we are in Uruguay, so have histories about social movements, important social movements. And decolonizing our imaginary is a collective work. So I'm trying to create the, the, the strategies to explain, to facilitate the explanation about these concepts. Um, and OK, I have a cool conversation with black kids in Brazil. Uh, because our imaginary starts in this age. So I'm trying to uh, create an uh, approximate, approximate, or yeah, approximate with these kids in this co public college in Rio de Janeiro, at Rio de Janeiro, to understand how the imaginary about technologies impact their lives. Okay, I have some works with uh, social movements in Brazil, activists to ban facial recognition in public security. So we, st we started this movement in 2018, and now we have a good, um, a good way to understand how the new government will be more... Um, incisive about this problem in Brazil. And to finish, for me, the critical approach to AI needs to be accountable, transparent, and equitable. 
I evitate to use these words in my presentation because it's the easy way to explain to coders and computer scientists. And we need to discuss our imagination before codes and before creating uh, amazing technologies we, we use in computer vision and whatever, chat GPT, blah, blah, blah. We really need to discuss about these problems and these concepts in events like this. So I'm trying to start this discuss in ML in the event in the last year about machine learning. And in Brazil, I'm trying to, how can I say? Oh my God, I'm very boring because in Brazil, I'm blah, 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 blah about this. <laughs> and I have, I have good things about the future if we, you guys and me try to mitigate this problem and try to create a new path to new technologies in AI. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Nina, for this awesome talk. Now we are welcoming Martin Rocamora, that is from the house. So he's an assistant professor in signal processing at the Universidad de la República, where he also achieved his bachelor, master's, and doctoral degrees in electrical engineering. So you would think that Martin doesn't want to move from Uruguay, never, but he also was a research visitor at Durham University in the UK and at Max Planck Institute in Germany. His research focuses on applying machine learning and signal processing to audio signals with applications in machine listening, music in information retrieval, and computational musicology. And I forgot to tell you that he also was teaching assistant and musical technology at the School of Music. So please welcome Martin Rocamora. <laughs> Hi. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so, the connection between music and AI is not new. Music streaming services like Spotify and Pandora have been using AI for music recommendation and, person and personalization for, for many years. Apart from users' behavior, they also analyze the audio signal in order to extract information such as timbre, tempo, musical instruments, and so on, to recommend similar songs. But in the last two years, there has been a boom of AI generative models, which can create new content like images, text, images from text, text from images, and so on which led to, to really new opportunities for, for, creative, uh, um, for the creation of new content and, and, and creative expression. I, I must confess that, that I've used uh, generative models to prepare several parts of, of this talk, in, uh, including the following lines. The, this AI generative boom has reached also music. And according to some experts, uh, 2023 will be the year of generative AI in music and sound effects. And they are probably right, because in only one week, in February 2023, four awesome models were released, generative models for music and sound. In one such model, you can write a prompt, a text prompt, and ask the AI to generate music according to your description. For the text prompt you see there, the result sounds like this. I think it works pretty well. <laughs> Makes me wonder if an AI will generate uh, next summer's heat. As AI continues to evolve, 
we can expect even more groundbreaking advances that will surely change the way we bond with music. AI could foster people's musical creativity, allow for new ways of music creation and interaction, and enhance musical practice and learning. I'm excited about this vision. Some of you may be excited too, some others could be more hesitant, because let's be honest, this future comes with a lot of challenges. One of such challenges is that of musical diversity and representation. Because most of these technologies are developed oriented towards, let's say, mainstream, popular Western music, which has uh, conditioned, let's say, the problems addressed and the solutions proposed so far. If an AI-based recommended system cannot make sense of certain music style, how on earth could it recommend it? So I think we should promote a multicultural view in music AI and even develop culture-specific approaches to deal with some particular music churns, like some of those in Latin America. Let me illustrate this with two examples of the kind of music I work with. The first one is Brazilian samba. So, uh, perhaps a strange sound, uh, sound stands, stands out. Uh, is it the dog barking? <laughs> A baby crying, a person laughing. No, actually, it's, it's a cuica, <laughs> which is, is it there? Okay. It's a cuica, which is a um, friction drum that's very common in Brazilian music. It, was, it has always fascinated me. I cannot play it correctly, but let me try to take some sound of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the point here is that this particular instrument could be troublesome for some machine uh, learning models for uh, musical instrument recognition, as, as, it, uh, as, as, as it is the case for people unfamiliar with it, right? The, our second example comes from Montevideo. So if you go for a walk in this city, you'll probably see people playing drum, drums in the street. This is a practice called candombe, which has um, uh, deep roots in, in the Afro-Atlantic tradition, has now widely adopted by society at large here in Uruguay, but still remains as a symbol of identity for the communities of African descent. It sounds more or less like this. Should be a video here. Okay, so I think uh, it may sound like a mess to some of you, and believe me, the rhythm is is really problematic for some computational or machine learning approaches for rhythm analysis. And uh, so this is this is why, with a group of researchers, we try to uh, improve AI in order to properly deal with. Uh, Latin American music traditions such as candombe and samba. In order to describe some of our work, uh, let's consider the following situation. Let's say we want to play along with the AI, right? So at least we should address the three following issues that are listed here. First of all, you'd like the AI to follow the beat in order to be synchronized with the music. Then we like the AI to feel the rhythm, not to play mechanically, right? To play in style. And finally, we will expect some sort of music interaction with the AI, okay? So 
As I said, to follow the beat means to synchronize with the music. It's like foot tapping or hand clapping. It may be quite straightforward in a lot of music styles, but it could be really hard in some of these music traditions, like candombe, because somehow they are counterintuitive for the newbie, for several reasons, right? And so uh, it's also tricky in those cases to find which is the first beat in order to count like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But this is essential if we want the AI to synchronize with the music and interact with it. So in this example here, I hope the video plays good. You're going to have the count, and I'm going to count with you for a while to, to get what's the beat. Yeah, it works. Right? So you have the, the beat to be like this. So, existing methods for beat and downbeat, downbeat is the first beat. Existing methods for, for beat, beat and downbeat tracking used to fail when dealing with candombe until our group proposed new approaches to, to do it correctly and with the help of other groups, now AI can uh, more or less <laughs> uh, correctly uh, treat uh, more complex rhythms like polyrhythmics or, or uh, asyncopated rhythms. And now we are interested in adapting pre-existing models and also exploring self-supervised approaches to, for, for the task when there is a lack of annotated data. Then, then there also, there's also the, the issue of filling, filling the rhythm. I say this is important because most music is not played mechanically in time right, like, like a, a clock. Instead, there are uh, small-scale temporal deviations of the events, that a phenomenon called swing in jazz, or, or groove, or rhythmic feel, depending on the music style. And this micro-timing, as we call it, is quite crucial in several Latin American music styles. Actually, it makes the difference between playing in style of, or out of it, right? So, as an example, let's focus on the drum in the middle. It plays a, a single rhythmic pattern throughout the whole performance. It's four strokes, ta 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 okay, throughout the whole performance. But they are not played mechanically. They are not played, like, in this way. Instead, more or less, they are played like this. Which for me has much more sense in terms of the rhythmic feel that it produces, right? So we proposed and trained machine learning models able to track not only the beats and the downbeats, but also the micro timing during a, a real performance of some uh, of these uh, music traditions like andombe and, and samba. Finally, there's the issue of music interaction. As you know, musicians coordinate each other uh, when playing music uh, in order to do things like slowing down or speeding up, okay? But how do they do it? Um, let's see an example here. It's the same recording, but in one moment they're going to they're going to start to to increase the the tempo the, the to speed up right you're going to have there the bits per minute annotated there and i also will show you when when it starts to speed up right so they start slowly Look. Faster. Much faster. 
faster and a lot faster than at the beginning, right? Cool. So how do they do it? I mean, okay, so there's a lot of information in the audio signal. For instance, asynchronous between musicians are important. It means I may play a little bit ahead of the others to convey the idea that I want to speed up. I may also use some particular rhythmic patterns to signal, hey, I want to speed up, right? <laughs> so uh, you may process the audio file, that's something we do, and extract all this information. But you know what? It may not be enough, because let's uh, see this again. Wow, you got it. <laughs> so the guy turns his head to the left, looks at the others, and somehow signals, hey, I'm ready to go, okay? So body language and facial expression is, is also very important here. So processing the audio uh, file is not enough. We need computer vision tools to, to try to get this, this kind of information. Uh, building a, a, a multimodal approach for analyzing the, the, the performance, right? So, that's it. Audio is not enough. We need audio and video, but more importantly, it's crucial to recognize that making sense of music is much more than processing audio and video files. And, then, and that the social, cultural, and historical context in which music is embedded has to be taken into account because it highly influences the, the way in which music is um, produced and perceived too, right? So this is why we build a multidisciplinary team here with people from the signal processing department and School of Engineering, Universidad de la Republica. They are experts in AI and signal processing. I've listed some of them. But also with people from the School of Music, musicians and musicologists like Luis Schure and activists. Uh, we, we count also on the advice from, local, from our local communities, uh, expert uh, candombe drummers and activists like Sergio Ortuño. And from abroad, we team with Luis Vizcaíno and his group at Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Magdalena Fuentes in NYU, I think it's over there somewhere, and also um, cognitive scientist Nori Jacobi at the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, among other collaborations, right? Because our ultimate goal is to improve AI applied to music to contribute to the understanding, access, and preservation of our, of, of our world's music heritage. And in the process, we also enjoy it. Applause for them.
So, well, I guess you just want to dance now and don't hear any more talks, <laughs> but <laughs> we thank Martin and his drummer gang again because it was really awesome. And with these drummers, we end the, the part of the AI stories from Latin America. So we learn about our languages, we learned about decolonization and how we should act and work for it. And we learned a lot about local music in Uruguay, so I expect that the ones that didn't know that enjoyed the, this mini show that we already have. Now we are moving to the other part because, as you know, we were like the whole week in the engineering university hearing stories from Latin America, but also from generous scientists that came from abroad to tell us about the last things that are happening in the world in AI and teaching the students. So the, the, the first one is going to be Nando de Freitas. Nando was born in Zimbabwe with malaria. He was a refugee from the war in Mozambique, and thanks to his parents getting in debt to buy him a passport from a corrupt official, he ended up living in a small volcanic rock hut in Madeira, Portugal without any water, electricity before the European Union got there, and without his parents, who were busy making money to pay their debt. At the age of eight, he joined his parents in Venezuela and began school in Caracas. He moved to South Africa after high school and sold beer illegally in black townships for a living until 1991. But at the same time, he learned to solve ordinal differential equations in his free time, just. But upper head was the worst thing he ever experienced. When he was at the university in South Africa, he strived to be the best student to prove to racists that anyone can do it. He was privileged to obtain a PhD at Trinity College thanks to scholarships by benevolent people who donate and invest in education. In 2017, he joined DeepMind as a full-time principal scientist to help with the vision of solving intelligence so that future generations can have a better life. Nando is also a senior fellow of Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and has been the recipient of several academic awards. So please welcome Nando. Muchas gracias, otra vez. Hoy voy a hablar del el sueño de las redes neuronales, um, the neural net dream. So we have a lot of new people here that were into the main presentation and probably want to know what is machine learning, what is all this stuff. Um, let's go with an example. Suppose you wanted to build a machine that could tell faces from non-faces. And we love those machines. I mean, we carry them in our pocket. Have you ever wondered why there's a box in the face when you're trying to point? Uh, that box wasn't there before 2002 and so on. They didn't exist. To build it, uh, to build such a machine, what people did is they collected big databases of images of faces and then images of things that are not faces, which we'll show soon. Um, they tried to do this by hand. They tried to say what a face is by coming up with algorithms. They tried to code this, and it always failed because people are very diverse, and it's really impossible for humans to um, be able to express um, exactly how a face um, should appear. So that's still loading. <laughs> okay. There were images on faces. But you've all seen how face detectors work, so you don't need that image. You have it on your phone. Um, how do we build a machine that instead of programming it, we just teach it? So the inspiration, obviously, is humans. We can teach humans to do things without having to program humans. And so how do humans do this? They have these networks of neurons. So about 100 years, almost 100 years ago, scientists started trying to replicate how neurons work with simple mathematical models. Mathematical models that of a neuron which takes a bunch of signals, it weighs them, and those weights, the, uh, is what we know as parameters, those weights decide what the neuron, what behavior the neuron will have, what will it fire for, whether that neuron is going to detect a face, or whether that neuron is going to sort of detect a pattern in language or the beat in music, and so on. Neurons, of course, don't come alone. 
Ja. I'm wondering if there's a way to load the whole presentation so that... Okay, bear with me. I can sort of just speak through it. Um, neurons don't come along, they come in big networks, billions of neurons come together, and then mathematicians and computer scientists and uh, neuroscientists and so on, theoretical neuroscientists and so on, try to build such models in computers. And the hope was, by building those models, we were going to be able to teach machines to recognize faces and be able to do all sorts of interesting things. Um, the first amazing work in this direction was the work of um, Hubel and Wiesel. And they found, by using electrodes in a cat in the, in, in the 50s, that different neurons were firing for different patterns. So if a, if a line was in a particular angle, then a neuron would fire if it's not in this other angle, the neuron doesn't fire. And this is why we started, this is how we started demystifying how brains work. I'm sorry, I apologize for... Um, I'm going to make a suggestion. Could I connect my laptop directly to the feed for the screen? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Let's do some engineering. <laughs> Conference, this happens like all time in conferences, so it's just leaving the experience, you know. And but now, no, we'll come back. And we have like two more speakers, and then we are going to do a break. I can tell to the Kipu participants, we're going to take a picture of all of us outside the theater. So, all of the Kipu participants go 
after Kim Jong talk to the outside, and the non-Kipu participants go to the Idea Villarino room, and then there's a second room where we are going to have our coffee break, and we will have like 45 minutes probably to chat and meet each other. So, yeah, you know what you are going to do <laughs> after after the talks, and we are going to be back at 17:30. But so, keep there, hang there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. They did warn me I shouldn't wear this T-shirt in Uruguay. <laughs> it just made me pay for it. My plan is to wear this T-shirt from every country in Latin America over the next few Czech Kipos. So I'm looking forward to visiting every country and collecting a T-shirt. All right, so... Machine learning works by collecting data. So we collect data, for example, if you want to build a machine to detect faces, you collect data of faces, non-faces, and then you teach the machine what's a face, what's not a face, and it learns, the machine learns to detect faces. Um, the machine is inspired by neurons because we know that humans can be taught. Therefore, if we can understand how neurons work, we should be able to tell, uh, teach machines. And we can take sort of these big networks of machines, of neurons, and in biology, and we can try to sort of replicate them. And that, that indeed, that inspiration has been there for many um, decades. And it started with the work in the 1950s of um, Hubel and Wiesel, who, did, who noticed that in the visual cortex of cats, there are neurons that will fire for particular angles in, in, in a, say, in which a, a line is presented to them. So, the mystery goes away. It's a very, building an intelligent machine is feasible because we can understand how the biological machine works. And we should be able to um, get an even better understanding and a greater degree of explainability if we can actually build it. If we can build it, we can learn a lot about how brains work. And who wouldn't want what, to know what a brain, how a brain works? That's one of the greatest questions of our lifetimes. And I think it's of our lifetimes because we're going to make huge, in, we have made huge inroads over the, the last few decades. And I think we might have the answers, um, at least for the young people here, before the end of your lives. Um, with a, using this inspiration of Hubel and Wiesel, Professor Fukushima, who's shown in this picture here, when I visited him in Japan, he's I think probably in his late 80s now, he came up with this architecture working with neuroscientists and engineers and so on in a multidisciplinary effort in the heyday of technology in Japan. Um, and they built this network architecture that essentially looks for these patterns in images. Um, and um, Jan Le Kuhn came up with a very smart way of how to learn these um, units, how to learn the, sort of the parameters of the neural nets, the, the sort of weights, the strengths, to in search over images and be able to predict where the faces happen or any other thing. So that's essentially the convolutional neural networks. And the way things learn, these machines learn, is you feed in the images through the network, you compute the number of uh, errors that the network makes, and then you change all these little knobs, you change all the parameters so that the error goes down. And if you study a little bit of calculus, you learn how to write an, an algorithm to do this. It's a very simple idea. So you can now take a neural network and you can just, instead of just predicting it to what's a face, what's not a face, you could just take all of the web, and I mean all of the web, and you could just ask the network to predict the next um, byte or the next word or next, or as we say, a token, which is um, it's a part of a word. Um, and you can start with some text, and if it can predict what comes up next, it can actually start answering questions, right? So, uh, how do you say love aki? Aki, where? Not even when I want to be there. So, the network starts predicting. That's a joke for those who were in my previous talk. And then, once it makes a prediction, the prediction goes back to the input, it makes another prediction. And, and so on. Although regressively, it's able to predict, uh, to answer questions. Um, it is also, if you train these models on all the web, and we're talking about trillions of tokens, 
a massive scale. Everything that say said, for example, in YouTube, every word in text that appears on the internet that's ever been written. Um, you start being able to get this behavior where networks are able to learn very quickly. Um, and this emergent behavior in neural networks has been one of the most fascinating things that has happened over the last few years, is to, you know, to see that, for example, here, just by showing a few examples of how you should, uh, what a user should do and what a chatbot should do, you ve the network very quickly, the language uh, neural network quickly learns how to be, act as a chatbot. And then you can go and have conversations uh, with it. You can also very easily teach it how to you know, search the internet and pull information and, and try to explain that information to you. Um, you can also condition it on text and get the network to sort of predict what code um, you should write. So, and we did this um, at, uh, with my colleagues at DeepMind, and this was sort of hit the headlines last year. Um, and it, the one way to think about it, all of a sudden we had a neural network could enter a coding competition and write code. And so people were complaining about that the code isn't perfect here and there. And um, there was this blog that made the point that, you know, it's like you have a dog that is finally talking, but now we're complaining that the dog's grammar is bad. Um, the models unleash a lot of creativity, as we've seen throughout uh, the day here. Um, we can use them to create text, like here a, a user of ChatGPT asked it to just generate um, ideas for, the, 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 um, for interior decoration for a room. Um, it generates the idea, some text, you condition on that text, you generate images, and now you can just start sort of creatively creating all sorts of interiors. Um, you can use the models just like we condition on text, we can condition on images, and you can have this multimodal dialogue about what's going on in an image or a video. Um, we c we've seen this before. This is meant to be a video, uh, and the whole presentation is videos, but they're not showing. But um, there is a, f I think. Some of you saw this before, but right now, um, just take the leap of faith, or if you saw my previous talk, that nowadays neural networks can generate videos. You can condition on text, they can generate videos, they're getting much better. So it's not just the, the, the year of music, but it could be the year of video as well, um, where we are now. Um, and I wanted to just sort of uh, do a shout out to Ruben Villegas from Ecuador, who's here. And he's doing some of the most interesting work on text-to-video generation, um, showing that you know, people from here, from Latin America, are really changing the world up there. Thank you. You can do music generation. You can even generate behavior. You can train these models to control, say, machines and so on, and, and learn to talk to you or move a robot arm and do all sorts of tasks. Um, and importantly, we can also use them for very fundamental research. We can use these models to do um, one of my favorite examples in AI, which is AlphaFold, which I think is like the most interesting thing that's happened in, in AI, which is how you can go from a sequence of amino acids to predict the protein st uh, to structure of a protein, to do to come up with a 3D structure. And this is important because the structure determines the function. Um, you should think of these proteins in, as, as nanomachines. And now we're able to design nanomachines. And by designing nanomachines, we can cure. This, there's a hope that we can will cure many types of disease. We might even design enzymes that will digest plastic or that will uh, grab CO2. Um, so the ability to engineer nanomachines is is one of the most thing, inter interesting things that's happening in our lifetimes and will transform the world. Now, I think it's made clear by some biologists who actually go on to say that AlphaFold changed the game. Bi there is a biology before AlphaFold and there's biology after AlphaFold. Um, so AI is really impacting um, the world of science. And 
it shows that it is possible and to actually live the neural network dream fully. And the neural network dream is not, it's important to think about startups and economy and so on, but the dream is also about solving some of the biggest problems that we face. Um, think about designing drugs, health. It mattered. We just came out of a pandemic. Keeper was canceled for two years because of a, in person because of a pandemic. Um, and one of the ways to fight viruses is through um, the design of these machines, of these nanomachines, which are the drugs. That's possible. It's possible to design enzymes to, uh, for the, to, to deal with things like plastics and so on. Um, ultimately, we do need to build the brains of robots. And that's where neural networks will come in. And robots will be essential if, you know, if you ever want to venture into space. And this planet is limited. You can actually calculate how long we have left in this planet. There's an upper bound. And our future depends on being able to do this. Otherwise, the only, in this very, very vast universe, there is this little bit of intelligence, and it's us. And the only way we can sort of preserve that is if we really understand it and uh, are able to go beyond it. Um, and it's really, imagine the neural networks that then will not just chat with us, but will start explaining to us about concepts of physics and will allow us to extend our knowledge. I think that will be possible within our lifetimes. Um, and even machines that we've seen how creative they are with music and so on. It would be amazing if they started helping with the designs of other machines. Uh, imagine if they could help us with design better uh, fusion reactors, solve the energy problems of the planet, um, solve the issues of water, desalination, um, and make huge inroads to end poverty, completely eradicate poverty. But to really eradicate poverty is not just about technology, it's about community. Many of you have said this before me uh, here. Um, community is what matters. The reason why I'm here was because when I was a student like most of you, there was a professor that came to visit me, and then I realized, hey, this guy's not that clever. You know, I, I, I'm just as clever as him. I hope that by being here, you've realized that I'm not that clever, and you can go much fur, far, further away than I've ever achieved, and that, that you can aspire to those dreams. Um, Uruguay has done so well in hosting us twice now. They've been amazing. This city is wonderful. The warmest people. We have the bands. We have the dramas. We, 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 we have the politicians. We have the startup community. We have the people who serve us those meals every day. It, it's just been such a wonderful co community here. And they've done an amazing job. The organizers work incredibly hard to get us here. We had all the sponsors making sure that we would all be able to have this event. We had a good start. It's not enough. There are a lot of people who are not represented in this, people from Latin America and so on. Um, a big part of this move is about being inclusive, bringing people on board. As a community, we are stronger. So I ask you to also look for the Kipo dream, not just the neural net dream. Reach out to your communities in your countries and bring new people, bring groups that are underrepresented into uh, Kipo and let's make the next Kipo even bigger and stronger. Thank you. So we thank Nando. Just in case you are wondering, Nando has La Celeste and used it already for the first talk, so he now changed it because he really loves Latin American soccer, so don't worry. And he's autographed with the, with the team, so better. So now we are welcoming Sarah Hooker. She leads Cohere for AI, a nonprofit research lab that seeks to solve complex machine learning problems. They support fundamental research that explores the unknown and are focused on creating more points of entry into a machine learning research. Prior to Cohere, Sarah was a research scientist Google Brain, doing work on training models that go beyond test set accuracy to fulfill multiple desired criteria interpretable, compact, fair, and robust. She enjoys working on research problems where progress translates to reliable and accessible machine learning into the real world. 
She founded a local Bay Area nonprofit called Delta Analytics that works with nonprofits and communities all over the world to build technical capacity and empower others to use data. Sarah is one of the co-founders of Trustworthy ML initiative, sorry, to the Trustworthy ML initiative, which is a forum and seminar series related to trustworthy machine learning. She's one of the advisory board of patterns, and amongst other efforts, she's an active member of the MLC research group, which has a focus on making participation in machine learning research more accessible. So please welcome Sarah. Let's see. Ah, perfect. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So can we please all stand up? Even at the back, at the top, let's all stand up. Yes. And let's stretch to this side, to that side, your back. And can you please turn to the person beside you, to your right, to your left, or behind you, and give them a big high five. <laughs> okay, now we can begin. <laughs> yeah. It has been uh, an incredible week here at Kipu. I feel so uh, humbled to have been here this whole week and to have gone to know many of you. Uh, I'm actually doing a little bit of a personal talk today, so in some ways uh, it's as much about my journey but also reflections on maybe what computer science can teach us and the history of computer science. I've been thinking a lot lately about a few questions. So one is what leads to breakthroughs uh, and why do some ideas exceed instead of others? And what leads to uh, some people being part of breakthroughs and other people's not? And a lot of why I've been thinking about this is that 11 months ago, I took a big leap. So I was a Google brain. Um, uh, it's actually nice. I had my reunion with Sammy and Pablo <laughs> this trip. But I had enjoyed working there for five years. And a lot of why I left was to take this leap and to start a research lab that is as much dedicated to top tier publications and breakthrough science as it is the way that we collaborate and who we collaborate with. Um, and so I'm now 11 months in, and so I've been thinking a lot about this question. Uh, and I'm hoping to share with you today both my journey and reflections, as well as the history of computer science. So I have a talk, it's short, <laughs> and it's only got three chapters. Uh, but the first one um, is foundations, perseverance, and then some thoughts on the way forward. Uh, this is a personal talk. It's much easier to talk about your ideas. That's typically the type of talk I do. And so I'm a little nervous sharing with everyone here, but I think it's very much in the spirit of this conference. So I want to start. Oh, OK, excellent. Wow, thank you so much. Saving the day. Wow, perfect. Um, I guess this is why we have the grand finale and all our experts here. So OK, but let's go. So foundations. Um, I want to talk about the first machines. So the first uh, machines were specialized, and they aimed to meaningfully automate math calculations. So we had things like the analytical machine in 1837, and then we had all the way to the ENIAC in 1945. A lot of why these aimed to uh, kind of help with calculations was because of their first founders. So this is Charles Babbage, he was a mathematician. John Markley, he did fire uh, angle settings for artillery being sent to Europe. And John Atenasov was a physicist and who found these mathematical calculations cumbersome. 
So we tend to weight most heavily the problems that are directly in front of us. And for uh, these lovely gentlemen, it was that they hated doing these cumbersome long calculations. And so that's what they wanted to automate. What's interesting is that this also teaches us. Oh, and this is a wonderful quote <laughs> from Charles Babbage. I wish to God these logarithms had been executed by steam.、Um, <laughs> but these two. Uh, uh, John, so John、uh, Tennisoff, as well as John Markley, also teach us a lot about what leads to breakthroughs. So would, they were very different as researchers. So John、uh, Tennisoff was in University of Iowa. He didn't leave. He basically was a very small lab. He only had his graduate student. He used to go for long drives to think about problems, and he was kind of stubborn. So he didn't get much funding from the university. John Markley was the opposite. He was very famous as an orator, as a speaker. He was a physicist, and even during the Depression, he used to fill large halls of people used to come to see him talk. He also traveled to universities frequently. Most controversially, he traveled to the University of Iowa, where uh, John uh, had was working on one of the first、uh, digital computing machines that was programmable. And the controversy is because、uh, John Atenasov accuses John Markley of taking his idea. Um, but what really happened is actually more murky. So John was just、uh, traveling more, found a position at University of Pennsylvania, and got funding from the military. What's interesting is that this is one of the earliest examples of this painful delay to progress,、um, and it's this race between the two to build the first computer.、Um, and they're so different. So. Worked alone in Iowa, collaborated widely. This also has huge implications for what happens next. So they were working on this important idea: how to build a vacuum computer. And John Atenasoff was actually successful. He was the first one to do it. But this computer never really was recognized by the world. In fact, it was in a basement in the University of Iowa.、Uh, so even within his own university, he didn't get、uh, kind of visibility.、Uh, Markley collaborated widely、uh, and. Was successful as being recognized as the first.、Um, the ENIAC and Markley is remembered in history as the first vacuum tube computer, and the other John is largely forgotten, if not for the lawsuit. <laughs> so one of the earliest examples of copyright within the computer science uh, uh, field. But I think what's interesting is that this story really tells us that location matters, and that access matters, and that how you collaborate and the resources you have determine a lot of the impact that you can have and who is remembered. And I actually think it's very relevant today because even today, location matters, access matters.、Um, we have trouble getting everyone to conferences. We often do conferences in places that are very inconvenient for a lot of the world. We often leave and go great distances to study to get training. Location still very much matters. What's remarkable, and what I think about a lot, is that modern computer science has only existed as a field for the last 77 years. So I was born somewhere in between, <laughs> in 1989,、um, and I didn't know about computers. So、uh, I actually grew up, and my dream was to work for the World Bank. So I grew up in Africa. My parents met in Sudan, and I grew up in Lesotho, Mozambique. Swaziland, Kenya, and then my parents just went to Liberia. But I wanted to grow up in the World Bank because that was the most technical profession that I saw. So I thought it was very something to be aspired to. My access story was that when I was in my last two years of high school in Swaziland, I got a scholarship to go to Minnesota, and this changed my life completely. I met my husband in the U.S. I found a passion. I had the resources to find job opportunities, and this was my moment of access. It also opened the doors, and I think it's the first door that opens that's the most important. And for me, that was a tiny startup that is not so tiny anymore, but it was called Udemy. So I was after I graduated, I still wanted to do economics. I still wanted to be a World Bank economist, and I was working in Berkeley with、um, economics professors doing antitrust modeling. But then at the weekends, I was discovering what is so unique about California. You work with engineers, you work with data scientists, and I started to realize, wow, this is an exciting world outside of linear <laughs> models that economists love. 
And someone gave me a chance. They took me on at Udemy, and the head of engineering allowed me to transfer because I came on as a data analyst. And they allowed me to transfer into the engineering team, and I worked on fraud、uh, models because we had instructors who used to post fake reviews on their own courses. <laughs> Interesting problem.、Uh, but we also had recommendations, and so that's why I really knew that I loved this, and it was one of the first opportunities. This led to another door that opened later, where I was. Given at the time the first, I think it was the second ever year of what was no longer exists, but existed、uh, for a brief moment. It changed the lives of many people, including me. But it was a brain residency program, and it was the second year, and I was accepted. It was a chance for me to really experience research and to work with people whose videos I watched.、Um, I, I feel like、uh, there's that sensation when I first worked into the kitchen. I'm like, wow, I read that person's book. <laughs>、um, and so this brings me to chapter two: perseverance. So location matters, access matters. But what else has mattered for the for the history of our field? So we're currently in an exciting time for large language modeling research. So I this morning I said I've only got 24 hours left here. I'm on video, so I said, "What should I do?" And、uh, this is a model that you can text that we use for testing.、Um, I did include the numbers if anyone's interested.、Uh, I did put that you might be charged, so because <laughs>、uh, <laughs> it's in the U.S., we've we've set it up.、Um, but look, these are such excellent suggestions, and isn't this amazing? Number three, <laughs> dreams come true. <laughs>、um, so this is all really exciting, but it's important to remember how we got here. So I want to introduce you to Joseph, Dr. Joseph Weizenbaum, who made one of the first chatbots called Eliza. So Eliza was a very popular form of therapy, Rogerian therapy, and it was very effective because it just repeats back to you. So, for example, I could say, "Oh, I'm giving a research talk tonight about large language models. Can you give me five reasons that large language models are exciting?" And it'll just repeat back to you the question. So it'd say. You would like to be able to give you five reasons, large language models, and then I'll be like, yes, and then it tends to use this hack. So it will use a stock phrase such as "Please go on" or "Let's explore that more."、Um, however, many users of Eliza were convinced that this was very lifelike. In fact,、uh, it it kind of pushed Joseph to write a book about how we shouldn't anthropomorphize models because he even found his secretary confiding confidential information about her boyfriend to the model.、Um, this is still something that is very pertinent. So, what separates Eliza from our current chatbots? Because I think this gives insight into the notion of perseverance. So, very for most of computer science history, two very different fields of thought existed. So, we had something like Eliza, which was rule-based models; you could only respond in certain ways. And then you had these deep neural network approaches, connectionist approaches that would learn a representation. And rule-based systems dominated mainstream research efforts for a long time, from the 1950s to the 1980s. So here, things like checkers,、um, things like chess, important progress was made using incorporating our knowledge as a series of rules.、Um, however,、uh, researchers working on connectionist approaches were marginalized. So、um, here are some of the researchers who were recently awarded the Turing Award. So. Yann Lecrun, Jeffrey Hinton, Yasha Bengio, but there's many more.、Uh, and in fact, a lot of this was、uh, kind of、um, talked about as this marginalization or、uh, the erosion of ideas. So very few countries preserve funding for connectionist ideas. In fact, it's no、uh, coincidence that many of the directors at Brain were all from Canada. <laughs> Canada preserved a lot of funding, and so a lot of the talent was resided in Canada when this breakthrough happened. And it took a moment in 2012 for all of this, all the field, to、uh, overnight switch to deep neural networks because the gains in performance were so dramatic. But、um, this was perseverance over decades. I think now we have a few more、uh, really important progress that has led to the moment that we're excited about. I'm actually going to run through these a little bit quickly, but we have things like the transform and algorithmic breakthrough, and we've paired that with important changes in optimization. Unfortunately, some of them are quite simple. I think this is something that we're all grumpy about as researchers. We want to understand better how we do this more efficiently and gain a better understanding of what's leading to these gains in performance. Um, but、uh, it's also things like changing how we collect data. So instructive fine tuning. Louisa and Marina both work on collecting feedback for、uh, input. But looking back, our progress has required this incredible perseverance. Perseverance, persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. 
It requires a sense of self. It also requires a belief in what questions you think are important. And then it requires the space or the resources to be able to pursue. Six years ago, when I joined Google Brain, um, in some ways, I should have felt like I had succeeded, because two years in, I had published papers, I felt like I had the trust and respect of my colleagues, but I very much felt like I was trying to fulfill someone else's rubric. Um, and I remember I had this moment two years in where I'm like, I won't be able to continue on this path unless I figure out what I care about within this, because there has to be something about what my research impact will be. And I remember, because it was overnight, and I said, let me just try and do things that I care about and see what happens. And it led to things like the hardware lottery, which I <laughs> wrote <laughs> alongside other papers, but felt truly special to me and felt like, wow, this is something that feels meaningful to me and is written a different way. Um, but it also meant that I really focused on, I want to collaborate cross-institutionally, and I want to work with first-time authors, and I want to work with authors who are in different parts of the world. Uh, like. Africa um, and India and Asia. And it resulted in just one of the most incredibly productive parts of my career as a researcher because I just felt like it opened so many doors. Um, and over the last 11 months, we've collaborated widely, so with 28 institutions. What I think was the special about this moment is that we all have to navigate this. And I want to end with this. So this is the third part of this short talk, but the way forward. So for most of computer science history, research has only taken place in a very narrow set of places, in academia. However, we're in one of the most exciting periods of computer science progress. Um, and so it's important that we also change the spaces where, how, and by whom people participate. The question of how we collaborate is intrinsic to how we progress. Um, often, how we collaborate is a result of both how we'd like to collaborate and how we're incentivized to collaborate. And if we don't change incentives, it's very hard for individually us to change how we collaborate. But sometimes, changes in how we collaborate can be a catalyst for evolving those incentives. And that's kind of my leap. <laughs> so, um, this talk was personal, but I think that this, spaces like this are so important for this type of progress. So weeks like this are so important, the friendships and the collaborations that start here, because this is where this type of progress occurs, where we start to change the spaces in which research exists, but also the ways in which collaborations can exist. Um, so I started this journey, this talk by sharing, I started a journey. Um, I want to share with something which is a highlight for me. So we have this full-time research staff, we also have this open research community. Um, I want to end up by sharing something I'm very proud of. So we now have 1,200 independent researchers from 101 countries. Um, and it's very special. So we're collaborating openly, and it's an open science community. Um, so we're also, we're still missing a few countries. <laughs> so if anyone here uh, wants to join, please, uh, please do. As you pursue this dream of contributing to ML research, you may have to enter spaces that are not your own. I think many of us will have to journey to other places or go into spaces where maybe uh, not everyone has our experience. And I think it's very important to preserve your sense of self, to remember where you come from, but also to remember you're there not to just be part of a space, but to change the space. And so with that, I really want to say thank you so much for this week, because I feel like this space has changed me. And I really thank the organizers and all of you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you want to stretch again, or we shall follow? <laughs> now, now we are welcoming Kyung Jung Cho, who is an associate professor of computer science at data science at New York University and CIFAR fellow of learning in machines and brains. He is also a senior director of frontier research at the Precinct Design Team within Gen and Tech Research and Early Development, the GRED team. He was a research scientist at Facebook AI Research from June 2017 to May 2020 and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Montreal until summer 2015 under the supervision of Professor Joshua Benjo. After receiving his master's and PhD degrees from Alto University in 
April 2011 and 2014, respectively. He received the Samsung Ho Am Prize at Engineering in 2021. He tries his best to find a balance among machine learning, natural language processing, and life, but he says that he almost always fails to do so. So please welcome Kung Yung Cho. Well, thanks for the generous introduction. And then, well, you know, the, the previous speakers were so amazing to the point that you know, the bar is too high. So you know, it's a bit you know, nerve-wracking. And also, I've never given a talk in this, this kind of majestic venue. So I'll try my best. Um, we have heard a lot about the, how AI is changing the world by solving a lot of problems that we did not even know how to solve. Even some of the limitations that we have heard of today, in fact, are the limitations because we now can actually tackle them somehow. There is a promise. And you know, the, every talk that you have heard today, you heard about ChatGPT. And then that has indeed become the word of the trade across the entire earth at the moment. So I go talk to people in Korea, they talk to me about ChatGPT. I'm here in South America, we're talking about ChatGPT. I talk to my colleagues in Europe because I studied there, they also talk to me about ChatGPT. I talk to my colleagues in Southeast Asia, they also talk to me about ChatGPT, and on and on and on. Now, one thing that we often tend to miss is what these language models, large-scale language models such as ChatGPTs cannot do. So I just wanted to share with you a conversation I had recently that I had also recorded on what cannot be done by large-scale language models. And I really did not edit anything because I wanted to also share with you what kind of thought process I go through in order to think about what are the potential limitations that existing technologies have and also what are the things that we can do in order to solve them. So the first question, of course, was to ask, you know, what most representative examples of tasks that large-scale language models of the current days Right? Although the current day is, is a bit, let's say, limiting in the sense that it's changing every day, uh, you know, that, that can be tackled. And then you know, the, uh, I'm going to call her Linda for now. Yes, she's going to be the, my counterpart in this conversation. And then the, six, uh, the list of the six items were given to me. The first one was the physical tasks that require some kind of interaction with the world. Second one was the tasks that require specialized domain knowledge. Third one, tasks that involve common sense reasoning. Fourth, tasks that require real-time processing. Five, tasks that have ethical or moral implica uh, implications. Sixth one, the final one, tasks that require creativity. I kind of agree with most of them, not all, so I decided to actually ask further each and every one of these items in the list. So first, let's talk about the physical tasks. For physical tasks that require sensor inputs and tasks, I thought it would be trivial to simply add an image or video as an extra input. And then already from Nando's talk, we actually have seen that the, these large-scale language models can be extended to take into account these sensory inputs such as images or videos. But then, according to Linda, it is possible to add sensory inputs, but it can still be very challenging for large-scale language models because it requires advanced computer vision and control systems as well in addition to the language models that we have been building. But then, is it really true? Is it possible that the computer vision and control are not up to the level of the language modeling. As an NLP researcher myself, I believe so, but I wanted to see if that is really the case, whether the computer vision researchers have not done their jobs well enough. And according to Linda, computer vision control systems are still not at the same level as language modeling, which makes sense. I don't know if you noticed from the Nando's talk, as well as the earlier talks, a lot of technologies used for computer vision, video processing, control, they are all converging toward a single technology that is based on language models. And you heard from the Sarah, all those technologies were already built and have been built over the many decades. So, okay, perhaps, maybe the issue is that the computer vision researchers need to do their job more, or perhaps the government should support them a bit further. So I thought, okay, I can buy that. Let's talk about common sense reasoning. And if you think about it, what is common sense? It's a big question. I always think about, okay, common sense is, what is common sense? In fact, it turned out common sense is a thing that we don't talk about because we assume everyone knows about it, right? So I thought, all right, now let's talk about the common sense reasoning. And I asked her to define what common sense is because that's the most important question to ask if you want to talk about this common sense reasoning. And then, according to her, common sense refers to the practical and informal understanding of the word that most people have and use in their daily lives. I was like, okay. That sounds like the common sense. So all the things that we don't write down. 
And then that does pose challenges to language models because if the common sense is a thing that is not spoken by us, because we all assume that the, we all know commonly, then how would language models actually perform common sense reasoning? And then indeed, Linda continues to tell me that the common sense reasoning is challenging because it goes beyond just recognizing patterns in data and requires a more human-like understanding of the world. Now, this sounds really nice, but in reality, what is human-like understanding? That is, in fact, the enti- there is an entire field, in fact, a multiple of them called psychology as, as well as neuroscience, that try to understand what human-like understanding is. And as far as I can tell, they are not succeeding as quickly as AI researchers are. So it sounds like, okay, nice answer, but that actually doesn't really touch upon the core of the question. So I just continue to ask her, what if we just had a large enough training set Although we don't talk about common senses among each other, but we do write them down quite extensively. And then that's what we do. We write. And then that's the reason why we have so much information in the internet that allows us to train these large-scale language models. But then, according to Linda, still, even with a large training set that can provide a language model with a vast amount of information, there are limitations in terms of understanding the context and make inferences based on their understanding. So at this point, I was like, okay, it seems like you know, we're making a circle. So I'm going to continue on to other items in the list. And then, oh, sorry about that. Actually, there was one more slide. This is my bad. I had to ask one more question. But then, if there is a case, how do we do it? Because all we do is to look around growing up and then try to collect the data and then use that data to train our own neural network. So how are we doing it? But the answer was somewhat dull, as in, well, we still actually don't know exactly how we do it ourselves. Which makes sense. If we don't know how we are doing the common sense reasoning ourselves, then how can we actually tell that the language models or the whatever the AI systems we build are performing or not ter- perform co- a human-like understanding or the human-like common sense reasoning? So then you ask, why? Why can we do it? The answer is that it simply, it seems like the current technology does not allow us to build such a system. Now, let me tell you one thing. This is just a conversation I had, and I do not necessarily agree with Linda on all accounts, and this one, I actually absolutely disagree, but we're going to continue. I hope, for, I hope that you're going to think about, uh, this is a nice cue for you to think about what are the things that language models can do, and what are the things that humans can do, and vice versa as well. So I thought, I'd, let's move on to creativity then. This seems like the one thing that has been touched upon, in fact, today, over and over. We heard about the AI for music. We, in fact, listened to the actual creative performance on the stage. So it seems like a distinctly or uniquely human endeavor. So I asked her, you know, okay, why is creativity an issue? From a machine learning perspective or the machine learning researcher's perspective, creativity seems to be simply a noise version of same, some mix of the past experiences. So I have heard a lot of music before, Based on that, I'm going to mix them up a bit, but because I'm imperfect, I'm going to introduce a noise. Is it possible that that's how we actually create new, let's say, audio or the new music? But it turned out that Linda has slightly different, let's say, idea. According to her, creativity involves generating new ideas and possibility that may not have been explicitly encountered before. So what is this possibility and what is this new ideas? And then you know, I just waited because Linda apparently had a very long answer to this particular question. And according to our large-scale language models, lack the ability to truly understand the creative process and generate truly original ideas because they are all based on statistical models. Now here, I very seriously disagree with it. So because the statistics does not necessarily mean that the new things cannot arise. However, I wanted to just listen to her all the way. And according to her, They they just cannot go beyond what has been seen in the training set. Now, this one, I actually do agree. So this is a very complicated, let's say, question that we need a lot of us, all the scientists as well as the people who are using these technologies to be aware of and then think about. What are these concepts that we give or that we assign to these large-scale language models or the AI systems? And can we actually say so? And then what are the implications from assigning those abilities that we have been thinking that those were uniquely human? And furthermore, she actually pointed out something really interesting. And then that is, 
The creativity involves making connections between seemingly disparate ideas and using imagination and intuition to explore new possibilities. And this is an interesting thing. Large-scale language models, however you have used ChatGPT or Bing.com or the not yet available Google Bart, what you notice is that it's always within a single conversation or a cups of the conversation. These models do have access to the, all the knowledge in the world because it has been seen. Uh, it has seen it during training. However, the way in which it keeps the memory and then updating itself real time and so on is largely lacking at the moment. And then perhaps there is a reason why these models are not as creative as we think they want, uh, we, we want them to be or we don't want them to be. So then I was like, okay, but can we not build a language model to have a certain capability just because we don't understand what the capability is or the, how the capability is built? What if we just edit it in or the build a system and then let it run and then it suddenly starts showing the creativity? In some sense, that's what, how we are. It's not like we know how we operate or behave, but we know that we are all creative. And then you know, the human population has been going up, except for in South Korea recently. It's been going up, and we've been creating all these creative agents all over. So indeed, Linda says that yes, that's not necessary. And not just because the process is now well understood does not mean that we cannot be implemented by a language model. However, Again and again, we lack the technologies to build such a language model. Now, I wanted to go further into this one, but I realized that the, well, of course, Linda can answer this because she doesn't know, we don't know, no one really knows about it, and that's the reason why we are all here. So then, yeah, I wanted to touch upon the real-time processing a bit because it was, it's really weird. What does it mean for language model not to be able to have a capability of real-time processing? And in fact, Uh, if you are aware, these kind of chat GPT or any kind of language models that are built on top of the technology called the autoregressive uh, sequence modeling is in fact perfectly su suited for real-time processing. It's going to read one word or the one, let's say, utterance at a time, and it's going to produce the response. So it's set, in fact, it is a real-time machine by definition. And then indeed, uh, Linda actually agrees with it. However, there is a limitation, there is a computational cost of running the model. And then this was touched upon multiple times today. And then this is one of the limiting factors for AI community to increase the inclusion as well as the diversity because the amount of resources that are needed for us to build and build, test, and deploy language models is simply at the moment out of the reach for most of the people all over the world. And furthermore, uh, Linda talks about the latency of the model, which is actually quite serious at the moment. It is in this real-time processing, but we have to often wait quite long. Not sure if you tried, you can actually apply for the beta access to Bing.com, let's say, chat feature. I've been using that for some time. It's quite amusing. However, once I type the query, I often have to wait 10 seconds to a minute or so, which is, in fact, prohibitive if you think about the usual search. Google search, when it was released, early on, they were aiming for sub-100 millisecond, let's say, latency in terms of search. But now we are asked to wait a minute to get an answer to often a seemingly simple question. And then it turned out that Linda always goes back to the multimodal processing because the multimodal processing requires us to have even more resources or that requires us an even higher level of the computational resources. So it makes it really difficult to deploy these systems in real life. So then I had to ask, you know, what if we build the chips? That's what is actually being done by a lot of startups all over the world. What if we actually have a completely different hardware that's going to implement these language models in a much more efficient way? In this, Sarah pointed out about the two parallel, let's say, um, uh, axes of the uh, development of the computer science, and then one of them that was not so successful until recently is, was called parallel distributed processing, and then that also touched upon the hardware. Can we, in fact, build a new type of hardware that is able to accelerate everything so much greatly? But it turned out that that is also not an issue because it's very expensive, indeed. And also, it actually doesn't necessarily mean that the faster hardware is going to lead to a better algorithm. In fact, the history tells us that it's been almost always the other way around. When people are put into the environments where we, uh, in the resource-limited environments, we have to be creative and then create all those new algorithms. So finally, I wanted to touch upon this the very thorny issue, and then we already talked about it earlier today, is the moral and ethical implications. 
So why, so the, why is moral implication an issue of a language model? This is a big question. If somebody was using a language model, shouldn't that be the user who takes on the moral responsibility of the implication of whatever is being produced by language model? Of course, some might say that that's not the case, because language models can be creative and produce things that are beyond what the user intended originally. And then the issue is that the, these creative or the newly created contents from the language models can encode all those social biases, as well as the, all those stereotypes that we in fact want to eliminate from the society. But thereby adding in all these stereotypes further and further is going to rather amplify all those things. And then in this case, we actually do want to think about the language models, harmful consequences such as reinforcing harmful stereotypes and perpetuating discrimination. So here, I totally agree with Linda on this point. I wanted to actually push a bit further, however, and I asked her, what if a propaganda materials were produced with help from a language model by a bad actor? then in that case, does Linda's answer imply that the language model bears responsibility for this propaganda material produced by a language model, with, oh, okay, by a bad actor, with the uh, help of the language model? And then indeed Linda, uh, well, Linda uh, replies that the responsibility for propaganda materials ultimately lies with the bad actors who produce and use them. The language model may have contributed to production, so it is important to consider the implication of such use. At the end of the day, language models, like any technology, can be used for both good and bad purposes. So I was like, okay, that sounds okay. So far, so good, right? I think the answers tend to be a bit overly political, in a sense that the, it's not, uh, the answers are not going to go into any of these extremes, but uh, you know, somehow fall in the center so that we can actually agree with this answer, these answers almost always. So I wanted to just wrap up the conversation. I asked Linda to just, okay, please summarize what we have talked about so far. And then she started by talking about the physical tasks that require sensor inputs and real-time processing. She talked about the common sense reasoning and inference. And she also talked about the creativity and original thinking, which I thought was the most fun part of this conversation. And the next one was understanding the nuances of language, which actually was not uh, dealt with uh, during the conversation, but she wanted to actually emphasize that one in the last minute. And then finally, she told me that we did talk about the ethical and moral implication. And then all these things are the things that I, as well as my research group, and then everyone in the community need to, and then perhaps are doing but not enough, uh, are thinking about but not enough so at the moment. And then we all believe that this is really important, to, uh, important things to think about. And also the awareness of the general public who are beyond the AR researchers needs to, uh, uh, is going to be really required. So let me just wrap it up you know, the, uh, with a couple of the words. First, I just wanted to introduce myself a bit more formally. So I'm an associate professor of computer science and data science at New York University. It's my second time here in Kipu and in Uruguay. So I'm very, really glad to be back. And I'm actually also spending half of my time at Genentech in a team called Prescient Design, working on AI for antibody therapeutics design. And then Nando was correct. Actually, we are working on uh, coming up with the algorithms that are going to help us find the drugs much more efficiently and also much more effective than before in order to make sure that the, we are not going to stuck to this. And unfortunately, this would have been, in fact, the uh, animation, but the animation is gone. So I told you that it was a conversation that I had with Linda, who is actually sitting here. But in reality, yes, Linda is here. But in reality, it wasn't really Linda. I got the permission from Linda to use Linda's as a face and the name, but it was a conversation I had without any editing with ChatGPT, the version January 31st, uh, January 30th. In fact, I literally went to the chat.openai.net, logged in with my Google credential, and then I just started asking these questions, and I did not even edit a single word that came out of ChatGPT, and I did not even select any particular answers. This was just a full conversation created with the open uh, ChatGPT on the limitations of itself. And uh, hopefully you know, it wasn't too offensive for you to now realize that in fact it was just ChatGPT. And then I didn't really spend any time creating this slide because I just literally talked to ChatGPT <laughs> and then asked ChatGPT to tell me what it cannot do for us. And the interesting thing I want to just uh, touch upon before I wrap up is that the, 
What I thought, and then what everyone thinks at the moment, is that when we talk to ChatGPT or this kind of large-scale language models, we are getting answers that were inferred automatically by these amazing AI algorithms based on the vast amount of data that is available on the Internet. That's what we all think. And then that's the reason why we find this amazing, and then that's the reason why we want to believe what it's saying. Because this is the collective human knowledge that we are listening to. That's what we believe. However, these ChatGPT, as well as many of the other large-scale language models, as Sarah pointed out, uses a lot of supervision and a lot of human-generated data that is actually not available to outside, nor the process by which the human annotation was collected was uh, made, let's say, publicly available. What that means is that the, what you hear from ChatGPT nowadays may very well be what Sam Altman, one of the co-founders of the OpenAI, wants you to hear. And then I believe that this is, in fact, one of the most important aspects that we have to keep in our mind when we think about the implication and impact of artificial intelligence, and in particular, the recent advances in large-scale language models. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. So thank you, Kung Yung. He's a lot nicer than ChatGPT, though, so they are not the same. Now, now we're going to a break, so please keep all members. Remember to go to the photo group. They don't keep the participants. Go directly to the coffee break, and we will be back at 17.30, so please be punctual. See you in, a, in an hour, mostly.
Welcome back. So now we are going to have our center key speaker, Peter Norvig. He's a distinguished education fellow at Stanford's Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institute and a researcher at Google. Previously, he directed Google's core search algorithms group and Google's research group. He was head of NASA's Ames Computational Sciences Division, where he was NASA's senior computer scientist and a recipient of the NASA's Exceptional Achievement Award in 2001. He has taught at the University of Southern California in Stanford University and the University of California at Berkeley, from which he received a PhD in 1986 and the Distinguished Alumni Award in 2006. He was co-teacher of an artificial intelligence class that signed up to 160,000 students, helping to kick off the current round of massive open online classes. His publications include the books Data Science in Context and Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, which is one of the leading textbooks in the field, among many others. He's a fellow of the AAA, ACM, California Academy of Science, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please welcome Peter Norvig. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Howdy. It's great to be here. I, I, I'm really enjoying my, t my time in this country. I've come here from one mountain view to another. Uh, and it, it took quite some time to get here. Uh, the talks all week long have been great, and especially this afternoon. Uh, you've heard a lot about using generative AI for various purposes, to create uh, music, to create uh, English text, and, and so on. And I'm going to tell you about how to use the same technology to do programming, and maybe what the future will be. And so, you know, uh, you heard my introduction. I've done several things. I've been a research manager, a researcher, but at my heart, I'm really a programmer, right? So it's most fun for me to be typing at the machine and getting stuff done. And here's the progression of uh, languages I've used throughout my career, you know, moving forward, maybe going to Java with a step backwards, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but I've enjoyed all of them. Uh, and now I'm thinking about what is the future going to be? How is this all going to change now that we have this amazing technology? So programming today is a programmer, a team of programmers sitting down and trying to instruct a computer what to do by using this obscure programming language that we've developed over the years. And then the, the computer has a very specific way of, of uh, executing those instructions. And that works. But it's a lot of work for the programmers to get it right. And as you know, you use programs that have bugs in them. We don't always get it right. Maybe in the future, it can be more of a collaboration. So rather than just saying instruction, here, do this, and maybe you got it right and maybe you didn't, maybe it's more of a back and forth. And maybe we have more expressive languages to say, here's what we want to do. Uh, and I hope we can get there. And I'm going to give you some idea of how I think that might happen. So when I started programming decades ago, we thought of it as a mathematical science. We thought of it as a science of logic and of proofs. That sort of, uh, as you could do in math, theoretically, you could prove your programs correct. In practice, you never really actually did. But you sort of knew that you, that you could if you wanted to. And the formal model, the mathematical model, or the programming model was all that matters, right? Yeah, so you heard in the introduction, I spent some time at NASA. That was really exciting for me. I got to talk to uh, Jim Martin, who's one of the uh, old veterans, and he was one, the one in charge of uh, landing the first spacecraft on Mars in 1976. And one of the things I remember him saying is, uh, you know, there was all this worry of, well, what's Mars actually like? You know, when it lands, is it going to sink a foot into the dust? And his answer to that was, it's not my responsibility to land on Mars. It's my responsibility to land on the model of Mars that the <laughs> geographers gave me. Right? So he thought if he satisfies the, those constraints that he was given, then he did the right job. 
And I can sort of understand that, especially in 1976. But there's also something about that that seems wrong, right? It seems like you should feel like it's my responsibility to get it right, even if they told me something that was wrong. And maybe we can have programming languages that are more flexible and that can help with that. Okay, so today it feels more like software is no more, uh, no longer a mathematical science, it's more like an empirical science. It's like doing chemistry or, or biology. That there's weird things happening out there in the world and you try to understand them and you have a partial model of how it works but it's not quite right and you get things wrong. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, when I started programming was you wrote everything by yourself. Now it's you download packages and try to understand them. And so it is like being a biologist and there's this field manual and says, here's this strange animal and here's how it behaves. And then you poke it in the way the manual says and then it behaves completely differently than what the manual said it was going to do and then you have to figure it out, right? So that's what programming is like today. And now we recognize that the formal model is just a simplification of this complex real world. Uh, so here's an example I wanted to show of uh, progress from 2014 to 2021. So uh, I, I pressed an extra button there. I was supposed to have the 2021 be a surprise. But in 2014, Randall Monroe wrote this cartoon showing how hard it is to explain what's difficult in programming and what's easy. So the product manager comes to the software engineer and says, I want you to identify when a photo was taken within a national park. And she says, sure, that's easy. Give me a couple hours. And then he says, uh, and tell me if the photo is a bird. And she says, that's a five-year research project. Uh, and it turned out seven years later, this guy posted a video in which he makes the bird recognizer app in 60 seconds. I think not quite, right? So if you look down here in the corner, it says a minute eight. And there was also, there was some fast forward in the middle. So let's call it two minutes, right? So that's amazing progress, that we can do these things now that we couldn't do before. Here's another example of an open world problem. Oh, and again, I'm, I'm, uh, the, the slides are advancing too fast. So I got this nice pop-up on my phone that says, time to return rental car to Logan Airport. It's got a map that's beautiful. And then I went and spoiled it all by saying, time of travel, 23 minutes by bicycle. <laughs> and that kind of makes sense because I do commute to work every day by bicycle, so I am used to going that kind of distance uh, by bicycle. Uh, but when you're returning a rental car, that doesn't seem like the right thing. So I went to file a bug report, uh, and I said, you know, here's the interaction, here's what happened. And then there's a little field in the bug report that says, which team is responsible for fixing this? And I realized every team did their job perfectly, right? So the, the calendar team and the email team pulled off this uh, uh, event and the map team did the job perfectly and they displayed the title of the event, return rental car, perfectly. But nobody stopped to understand what does return rental car actually mean. And I gotta admit, I, you know, I think I'm a pretty strong bicyclist, but if I was towing that car, it'd probably take me more than 23 minutes, right? So the, so the problem is that the world is open-ended and we build these software systems that are closed, that just say, I'm going to take the title and I'm going to display it in this field rather than I'm, I'm going to understand all the implications of that event. So I thought, well, now we have these large language models, maybe they can solve that problem. So, um, you know, Andre Karpathy recently said, the hottest new programming language is English. Uh, is that right? Let me try to solve this problem in English. So I went and said, uh, I have to return a rental car to the airport. Should I go by, by bicycle? And you get the typical wishy-washy answer that doesn't want to commit to anything, right? So it says, that well, depends on several factors. That starts off almost every answer. Uh, distance to the airport, weather conditions, physical fitness, availability of safe cycling routes. So it's trying to keep me safe, right? It doesn't want me uh, taking an unsafe route. So that's great. And it was a really good answer to, should I go somewhere by bicycle? But it's a terrible answer to, should I take my rental car by bicycle? So it's just, it's still missing this stuff. And so, you know, now I feel like, well, these things have great promise, but they're not reliable. So how can I, you know, and I'm trying to build software that's going to reduce bugs, not increase them. 
How can I use such an unreliable system? Uh, and then, you know, you get things like this, uh, where uh, publications are saying these systems are racist and terrible. So have I got to go and de start deploying things that are racist and terrible? Well, it wasn't quite racist to, uh, to say, uh, take, take the bicycle, but it was at least wrong. But the hope I have is that we have a lot of experience in doing this, right? So we build data centers out of uh, unreliable components. We build a data center, and we know a couple computers are going to fail, a bunch of hard disks are going to fail, a bunch of network connections are going to fail, but the data center is still going to do its job. And all the, the pieces of the computation that uh, broke are going to get restarted and redone, and eventually we're going to get a reliable result out of unreliable components. So the hope is maybe we can tame these large language models and use them even though they're unreliable. And so how can we do that? Well, here's part of a list of uh, the types of things we could do, uh, but I don't want to get into the technical details. So let's just uh, go ahead and go ahead by going backwards. And I want to think back to 1945 when the uh, suggestion for basically the first search engine was made. It was this uh, physical device called the Memex, which is basically a desk that had the state-of-the-art technology, which was vacuum tubes and uh, uh, microfiche uh, projected up on the, onto the top, and you could take pictures and add to your library, and you could annotate it and so on. This was done by uh, Vannevar Bush, who was uh, kind of the leader of post-World War II science uh, in the United States and, and by extension throughout the world, right? So he's the one who invented the National Science Foundation and said as a country it was going to be important for us to invent uh, or invest in science. And he invented this idea of hypertext. He said, uh, you know, part of it is he realized hey, there's a lot of publications now. It used to be if you were an expert in the field, you could read everything in your field, and that's no longer true. And, of course, it's much, much worse now. And so he said there's going to be new forms of encyclopedia. He didn't quite say it was going to be Wikipedia. Uh, he invented the idea of hypertext and so on. Uh, but I think the, the most interesting thing about this article, and you should read it, it's really a, a, a historical piece, and it's, it's worth taking a look at, uh, but was this conclusion that the world has evolved to an age of cheap, complex devices of great reliability, and something is bound to come of it. And we don't really know what that something is. Uh, but let's try to investigate and take advantage of that. Uh, so why is AI hard uh, compared to traditional software? Uh, and I so I, I want to try to define what AI is, because to me, AI and software are kind of the same thing. They're both aimed at making programs that do the right thing. And so uh, I'm going to look at three applications, a banking program, which is traditional software, a chess playing program, which is old school AI, and a self-driving car, which is modern AI. And these are all the problems that we have to deal with. And so for the uh, bank, to, to write the software for a bank, there's two things that are hard. One is it's uh, multi-agent, so there's different customers that are making transactions at the same time. And secondly, there's software complexity, because there's a million different rules of what fees and taxes you have, and you have to get everyone right. But the rest of it is easy, because there is a correct answer down to the exact number of cents, and all you have to do is get that right. In playing chess, there's other things that, that make it harder. Uh, so there's computational complexity, that nobody can compute the exact right answer for playing chess. I can compute the right answer for playing tic-tac-toe, but for chess I can't, so I have to guess at it. And then for the self-driving car, there's all these new things that come in, that the world's uncertain, we don't uh, observe all the world, uh, it's non-deterministic, you step on the brakes, and you know you're going to stop, but you don't know exactly how much you're going to stop. Whereas when I would draw a dollar from the bank, I know exactly how much I've uh, changed, and when I move my pawn forward, I know exactly where it goes. So to me, the definition of AI, or what, what makes it special, is this dealing with uncertainty. And I have this history of AI where we start in uh, 1950 or, or so, as, as we heard this morning, we focused on algorithms, then we had the era of big data, where we said maybe the algorithms aren't as important if you have enough data, 
And now I think we're really in this era where the important thing is the objective of saying, yeah, we have these cool techniques to optimize stuff, but what is it that we're trying to optimize? What's going to be fair? What's going to benefit everybody? What's going to be unbiased? And how do we specify that? And that's really the challenge we have. So, can a neural net write code for us? Here's this great quote from Ed Edgar Dijkstra, one of the most distinguished computer scientists, who said, in the discrete world of computing, there's no meaningful metric in which small changes and small effects uh, go together, go hand in hand, and there never will be. And so what did Dijkstra mean by that? Uh, so he said, you know, in calculus, you have a function like y equals x squared, and you make a small change to x, and you're going to make a small change in y. But in programming, you flip one single bit in a program, and it could do something completely different. And so he was saying, essentially, that this idea of gradient descent is, is doomed. Because, uh, you know, as, uh, as you heard this morning, the idea of gradient descent is you have this lost surface, and you start somewhere, and it's a little bit bad, and you move somewhere, and it's a little bit better, and you keep on moving until you get to a point where, where everything is good. And you can do that because you're kind of moving down in this roughly smooth bowl. But Dijkstra essentially saying he thinks the surface of possible programs is like a, a, a spiky porcupine, not like a smooth bowl. And so there's no way to, to do that. Uh, so that's discouraging. On the other hand, Arthur C. Clarke says, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he's almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he's very probably wrong. So, so that gives me hope, right? Because I'm elderly too, and I'm saying it's possible, and Dijkstra's saying it's impossible, so maybe I'm right. And then uh, the computer scientist Ken Thompson says, when in doubt, use brute force, and our tensor processing units say, I, I got this, right? Uh, so we can do amazing things now with the hardware that we couldn't do just a few years ago, and so it's opening up these possibilities. Uh, Chris Peach, who teaches the introductory class at Stanford, told me that 100% of the exercises in this class are solved the first time by ChatGPT. So that means he's going to have to go back and change the assignments. Uh, <laughs> and it's encouraging, but maybe not too much because maybe the kinds of problems he's assigning might be the ones that show up lots and lots of times in the training data, so maybe it's not really solving them, maybe it's just memorizing them. Uh, and we have a, a bunch of these automated programming approaches now. Uh, Nando told you about alpha code, and, uh, and that's the one I want to concentrate on. So this is the main example uh, they had in their blog, and uh, I don't expect you to read that all, but the point is, that it's a description in English, uh, free form, nothing, no formal language to it, just you've got to be able to understand English. And then in the middle there, there's an example of a sample input and output. And so uh, let me just summarize by saying here's what the program is asked to do. So you're given two inputs, a source and a target, which are strings of letters, and you're asked, could I type the source characters but for some of the characters, I can replace them with a the backspace, and that deletes that character in the previous one, and then can I get the target character from that? So if you're given A, B, A, B, A, can you get B, A? And one way you can do that is by typing backspace for the first three characters and then typing B, A, and then you should output yes. So that's what the, the program is asking you to do. And here's the answer. And what I'm doing here is uh, criticizing the dog. <laughs> Right. Uh, so AlphaCode wrote this program, and in one sense, it's awesome that it gets this right. It's incredible that this complex program, it, it read that English description, and it got the answer that's right. On the other hand, you know, as a programmer, we don't let just anybody check in any code. You've got to do a code review. And so I went through this, and, and again, you know, it's supposed to pop up one at a time, but when they uh, transferred this uh, over, everything appeared at once, so it's kind of messy. Uh, but there's a lot going on here. Of, you know, here's 10 different things that I thought the program was, was doing wrong. And let me just stop here for a second and say, so I know some of you in the audience are programmers, and you can eat this up line by line, and some of you are not. Uh, I think that's okay for both of you. You can both enjoy it, 
That's right. So last night uh, I enjoyed listening to NTVG. I didn't understand any Spanish, <laughs> but I got the idea of what they were trying to communicate. So if you're not a programmer, don't worry about it, right? And if you are, you can look at some of these things, right? So some of it is style type questions. Uh, the style is just kind of weird that they, they use these one letter abbreviations and that's considered not such good style. And maybe the reason for that is they're kind of training not for writing regular code, but for uh, writing uh, answers to programming contests. And in programming contests, speed is really important. And so people that participate in those tend to use the one letter uh, characters because it's just faster to type. So maybe he's learning from that. Then there's other little things like, uh, and it you know, doesn't bother me that much, but the uh, Python experts go crazy when you don't put spaces around the equal signs. <laughs> so Nando, I know you're out there somewhere. That's an easy thing to fix, and it would make them all feel a lot better. PEP8 says you have to put the spaces around the, <laughs> the operators. OK, so you can fix that. And then there's some weird things. Uh, so uh, here, uh, so the idea is you've got, you've got these two lists, uh, A and B, and you're popping things off of list A and comparing them to list B. And when you uh, pop something off of list B, you append it onto list C. That sounds like a good thing to do, because often when you're manipulating lists, you want to save the results somewhere. So that, that seems good. And then C is never used anywhere else in the program. Right? So what's going on here is it's saying, what's the kind of thing you normally do? Oh, here's something you normally do. Turns out we don't need that for this program, but I'm not going to bother to go back and fix what I normally did. Uh, right? And so that's what code reviews are for, to say uh, we got this wrong. All right. So still, amazing that the dog talks. Uh, we could make it talk in a slightly more refined way. And so what I want to imagine is what would, be th that, what would that be like if we had a better talking dog? And how would we build programs like this? And so I'm imagining a collaboration, sort of a conversation between a human and a program. And let's see how it goes. Uh, so the first thing here I, I say is, OK, well, you wrote that program, but it was all straight line code. And I want to do things like test it. And that'll be a lot easier if it was a function rather than uh, just straight line code. So can you make it a function? And it says, certainly, I could do that. Here it is. Uh, and then you say, OK, great, but it's hard to understand if that program is really correct. So one thing that's useful to do is say, can you show me a version of the program that's obviously correct, and even if it's slow and inefficient? And we want to just sort of have that in the bag to, uh, to deal with. We want that to be part of the record. And so here we say, yeah, well, one thing we could do is you take that input source and figure out all possible ways of pressing backspace or not, and then say, is the target one of those ways? So that's an inefficient way of solving the problem, but it's a way that you can make it very clear that this program is correct. Uh, so we would do that, and then you say, what are the tests that were given uh, in the program description, and can you run those tests for me? Uh, that would be great to, to automate that sort of easy process. And then, well, that wasn't enough. Can you write some more tests for me? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's quite a skill to get this quite right, to say, what are the key tests? Uh, but maybe we can imagine a program that would do that for us. Uh, then time them and say, uh, yes, well, you know, your version was actually more efficient than the uh, slow but obviously correct version. So that's good that uh, uh, you did a better job there. Uh, but can we come up with a program that's both easier to understand and efficient? Uh, and first, tell me your plan for how to do that, right? Because part of the problem with the original program is it had no documentation. It didn't say what it was doing. You could understand it line by line, but we'd like to also have a, a sort of a description of what's the plan for doing that, right? So part of the programming process is not just getting the right answer, but it's explaining and being able to convince people and uh, uh, make it trustworthy that, yes, I understand what you were doing, and I agree that that's correct. And we don't need to go through all the details there, but, but here's why. Uh, 
when you're trying to figure this out, it turns out it's easier to scan right from left rather than left from right, and, and the uh, AlphaCode program did that. And so uh, now we say, uh, here's another version that's easy to understand, uh, but uh, maybe a little more efficient. And it says there's three ways in which the backspacing could work. One is if the target you're trying to get is a suffix of the source, then you can just accept all those letters and delete all the others. That's good. If the end characters match, then you can match those and then try to recursively match the rest. Uh, and whether or not the end characters match, you can always uh, backspace and then try to match from there. So those seems like those are the three possibilities. And we can run that function and compare it. Uh, and next we can say, uh, well, here, if they matched, uh, then we could try it. If they, if they don't match, we, we try it both ways. So is, uh, is it necessary to, to do both ways, or, could, or we only have to do it one way, which in fact, uh, what the alpha code program did. Uh, and here's an argument for why you can make that optimization. And now you have a program that has just one more clause and uh, runs much more efficiently uh, and is still short and concise and, and easy to see that it's correct. Uh, and then uh, the program could warn you, uh, yeah, that works, but uh, the way Python works, a uh, recursive function won't, won't go beyond a couple thousand characters. So I'll automatically translate it from a recursive function to an iterative function for you. Uh, so that's a nice help, and those, that's the kind of transformation you'd like to happen uh, very reliably. And maybe we can build systems that do that. Uh, so now we have this program. Uh, it seems like that's simpler to understand than, than the original one, clearly right. Uh, note that this one's still dealing with the strings as they were. And so the next question was, uh, well, the AlphaCode program translated those strings into lists. Why did it do that, and was that a good idea? And the answer is yes, it is a good idea, because popping one element off of a string uh, means you have to make a copy of all the rest of it, but popping one element off a list, if you pop it off the end, uh, you don't have to make a copy. Unfortunately, the AlphaCode program went down that path, but then took a wrong turn, and it tried popping off the, uh, the left-hand element of the list rather than the right-hand, uh, and that's uh, just as inefficient as, as the strings, so we can correct that, and then we get this program, right? And so it's this iterative process where uh, we want our automated system to do some of the work for us, we want the human to do some of the work, and we want the human to be able to follow along the whole way to have this confidence that, yes, we've got this right, not just Here's the program, it's this big ugly thing, I can run it, it gets the right answer, okay. But yes, it does the right answer, it does the right answer on some additional examples that give me more confidence in it, and we have this whole history of transformations of the program, and if we can follow them step by step, then it's easier to see that it's true. And so I think programming should be all those steps. It shouldn't just be the end step, it should be the whole process. And I think systems like this can help us do that. Okay, so here's another collaboration by a guy named uh, Daniel Tate that happened uh, just last week. And uh, so he went to chat GPT and had it uh, invent a game for him. And uh, he said it took a few hours. Uh, the first version only took a, a minute or so. And here's what he said. Uh, so he said, can you invent a logic puzzle similar to Sudoku that doesn't currently exist? And ChatGPT said, sure, and it came up with this example. And Daniel said, okay, you know, that's nice, but I don't particularly like that game. That doesn't grab me. And so he said he had uh, four chances of saying invent another game. Uh, and then he got one that he liked. He said, that seems like that would be a fun game to play. And then he said, generate the code for it, and it did. Uh, and then he said, uh, put in some uh, CSS code to make the, the game prettier. And it did. And then he got this. And so here's what the game is, is uh, you get this array, and it's filled in with numbers. And then in the right-hand column in the bottom 
are these sums that you want each, uh, each row and column to add up to, and you have to delete some numbers so that the sums uh, add up right. And so you have to have the constraints in both the rows and the columns to make it work. Uh, so, you know, seems like a reasonable game. Uh, that's that version. And then he said he spent an additional couple of hours just making it look prettier and having more input-output options. And unfortunately, he didn't really say exactly how that collaboration worked. Uh, and, you know, how much was he doing and how much was uh, the automated system doing. But the point is, he, he got to this game, he got the first version uh, very quickly within a few minutes. The rest of it, uh, maybe he could have done it just as fast programming himself as, as uh, interacting with the system. Uh, but in the end, it works, right? So that's very promising, right? So the right person with the right skills at driving this collaboration can make it work. The next step is to say, can we bring this to everybody? Right? So can, can everyone be a programmer? Or you know, maybe they don't think of themselves as a programmer, but can they say, I got some task I want to do, I can ask how to do it, and then together we can come to an answer. And I think that will open things up to, for a lot of people to be more productive, to be able to do things in their life that they couldn't do before. I think the closest thing we've had to that in the past is the spreadsheet, which allows people to do calculations faster than they could have before without uh, you know, making the step all the way to being a programmer. And, and maybe this technology will be able to do that as well. Now, uh, so the other question is, can a neural net write code? Where is it? So uh, the Dreyfus brothers had this model of expertise where you start out as a novice and you move up to expert. And I would say alpha code is in the advanced beginner of, uh, in the Dreyfus model. So that says limited situational perception, all aspects treated separately with equal importance. And it's not quite to the level yet of uh, perception of actions in relations to goals, deliberate uh, planning. It does some planning, but, but we need it to do more. And it's definitely not at uh, taking this holistic view and transcending reliance on rules. And I think, why is that? Well, one reason might be half of people are below average. And, and this was trained on code from whoever generated it. And so half the stuff it was trained on was below average. Uh, so one of the questions is, how can we fix that? Can, can we uh, train it only on the good stuff? Then there's going to be less training data. Is that going to be OK? And also, the programming languages we have are designed to be used by people, not to designed to be used by these collaborations. So maybe we need a completely different language, right? So uh, you know, languages we have are designed for the memory constraints that humans have, not for machines that can memorize billions of parameters and, and trillions of data points. Uh, maybe we should have a different language for communication, but then we have no examples of them to train on. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. I'm not sure how that's going to be resolved. And then the, another question is, so we've got this collaboration. We've got the person and the machine, and they're going back and forth. And there's all these tasks, and we have to decide who's going to do what in which case. And maybe it's going to differ from task to task. And maybe there's going to be uh, specialist machines to do some of them. Uh, we already have a system where uh, uh, people can communicate in various ways to, to combine on a task, right? So there's open source projects where there's people all over the world uh, working together. Uh, and maybe we'll have new forms of collaboration where different groups of people combine with different groups of programs to come up with answers to programming tasks. And then, uh, uh, here's a picture of the software life cycle, and so there's a lot going on in, in this diagram. What I'm trying to say here is, you know, so far I talk mostly about the uh, programming process where we're actually writing code, but that's just a very small piece of software development, right? So it starts off, we have a strategy, what is it we're trying to build? We have design, how are we going to build it? Then we have the development where the, the coding and the testing and the quality assurance live. Uh, then uh, deployment into the world and maintenance and monitoring as, as we go. And at each one of those steps, there are documents that are produced and there are teams that are working on them. And they all combine together to make this final product. And one of the issues I think we have as a field 
is that we have really good tools for combining the code down here at step three, right? So we have these version control systems where every version of the code is uh, kept, we have that history, we know who changed what and so on. But for all the other stuff, uh, we don't have that strict controls because we sort of think of them, they're peripheral to the process, they're not really part of the process. And one of the failure modes I've seen again and again is we make some document, right? And so for example, I remember a project where uh, there was a significant uh, user experience design process where the uh, user experience designer said, well, there's various interfaces we could have to interact with this program. We're gonna design a couple, then we're gonna test them out, we're gonna bring people into the lab and show them the interface and have them use it and, uh, and measure which ones are successful and not. And then at the end of the report, it says, uh, here's the one that we think is best. And so everyone gets congratulated, say, that was an awesome report, you did a wonderful job, we liked the one you recommended, We'll hand that off to the engineers and they'll go implement it. Then a year goes by and the world has changed. Maybe people are trying to access it on uh, different size devices than they were in, in the past, or maybe there's some other services that interact with it. And now all of a sudden, the choice of the user interface is no longer the best one. But we, uh, you know, the only way we can recognize that is if somebody on the team happens to say, hey, you know, remember when we did that study? Let's go back and revisit that. And most of the time that doesn't happen, right? So that work is lost because it's not part of the running program, it's just this stuff off to the side. And I think that's something we have to fix. And the cool thing about uh, neural nets, as Nando explained to you, is we give it some inputs, we get an output, if the output is wrong, we have this process of backpropagation to say we're going to fix the network. We're going to make it better because it made a mistake, and that mistake is going to help us uh, fix it. We don't have that for the whole software process, and we should, right? So we should be able to do backpropagation through everything, through the strategy, the design, the testing, uh, the user experience documents, and so on, and we say here's a change in the world, now we have something that's suboptimal. What is it that we should change in the whole software process, not just in the code that happens to be running? And we could say, oh, this design decision way back here that we made two years ago, that's the thing that should change. And we should be able to uh, at least semi-automate that process and figure out where it's gone wrong by capturing everything in the software process, not just the running code. And that, that's my hope for the future. Uh, so I wanted to go through a few more things here. Uh, can a neural net plan and ex explain solutions? So here's a, a different system called Minerva, which is answering math questions. And the question was, a triangle has sides measuring one unit and three units. The length of the third side is an integer. What is the length of the third side? And if you think about that, uh, yeah, you know, it eventually gets the right answer, which is three. And so it's, it's a triangle that has one on one side and then three and three on the other side and any other number wouldn't work because then it'd be a, a straight line. Uh, so it gets the right answer, that's good. Uh, but it's also asked to give a description. It says, since the sum of the lengths of any two sides of a triangle must be greater than the length of the third side, that's good, that's, that's correct and it's the key point. We must have one plus three is greater than x and one plus x is greater than three and x plus three is greater than one, uh, and that's all correct, that's great. But then it says, which gives us these three things, and it gets two of them right, but the third one, it says, one plus three is greater than x is the same as x is greater than minus two, when it should have said uh, that's the same as x is less than four. So it made a mistake there, and it's weird that it made that mistake, but it did. And then it goes and recovers. And the way it recovers, it says, since the sum of any two sides of a triangle must be less than the third side, uh, then it goes and it comes up with, with uh, the axiom it needs. But that's complete nonsense. Uh, it, and it's like, if you remember, if you've seen the, uh, the Wizard of Oz, when the scarecrow is given his college degree, he suddenly acts smart. And he says, the sum of the square roots of any two sides of a isosceles triangle is equal to the square root of the remaining side. And everybody's impressed. 
but that's complete nonsense. <laughs> and so that's what Minerva did here. Uh, and yet it got the right answer. And I think part of what's going on here is uh, the way this works is you run the system multiple times and it comes up, for each time it comes up with a description and a, and a number and then you vote. And you say, well, a lot of the descriptions are saying three. Uh, and a couple of them are saying something else, but most of them are saying three. So I think three is the answer. And then we'll just pick one of the model answers uh, that said three. And so, you know, sort of the voting helps get the right answer, but nothing helps get the right description. So we need some kind of system to say, can we combine these descriptions or can we figure out which of the descriptions are right or compare them to each other and say, here's where these descriptions conflict. Oh, this one must be wrong and this one is right. But we don't have that yet. Uh, here's an example of translating informal to formal language. Uh, yeah, and that's a useful step in being able to do mathematics, right? So here it's saying the way we're gonna do, solve these problems is not just throw everything into a language model, it says we're gonna translate the, the sort of English description into a formal mechanism that a existing theorem-proving program can use. Uh, and that's a way of saying, if the thing you translate into is correct, then you're likely to get the right answer. Uh, similar work here uh, in, in solving math pro problems saying the way I'm gonna solve a math problem is I'm gonna translate into a Python program uh, and then I'm gonna translate the Python program into an explanation. Uh, and again, you could have done this all in one shot, saying let's go directly from the English input uh, to the explanation output. But I think having something formal, whether it was that uh, uh, formal theorem proving language or a programming language helps in that it's a constraint on what you can say. Uh, it has to, you know, and you can test it by you can saying, well, I can compile this and I can run it and see does it get the right answer. And so it gives you confidence in what you have there. And then it also helps for debugging purposes that a human can interpret that. Whereas if you go direct end to end, you don't have anything human interpretable in the middle. So I think this is a really interesting approach of saying, can we solve these problems by translating to a formal representation in the middle. And then the next question is, what's the right formal representation for that? Probably Python isn't the best, it's just one that we have around. Uh, what are we going to invent to be that language that we translate English into? And then I wanna to get to this question, everybody says, okay, uh, you know, I've enjoyed being a programmer, should I give up because all the jobs are gonna go away? I don't think so. So one thing is, uh, this job of being an AI prompt engineer, that's hot. So that's a possibility. And I also think it's just gonna mean there's going to be more programming jobs and everyone's gonna be more effective. Uh, there's gonna be more to do, uh, so don't worry about it, right? If you've got those skills, uh, they're gonna prove useful. Um, and then a little bit more on prompt engineering here. So Gary Marcus is this uh, noted critic of AI. Uh, and uh, uh, he pointed out uh, that uh, these uh, systems can't uh, distinguish between uh, uh, an astronaut riding a horse and a horse riding an astronaut, right? So it's impressive that you can have a picture of an astronaut riding a horse, probably something that's never been generated before, but it doesn't know the difference between the two. And then the answer here, uh, this guy, uh, Bainam Nashabur, said, yeah, that's true. If you say uh, a horse riding on an astronaut, it doesn't get it. But if you say a horse riding on back of an astronaut or on shoulders of an astronaut, it does, right? So that's you know, a, a little bit comforting comeback, but I hate that you have to, that one thing works and another thing that's so close to it doesn't work, right? I, I would rather have more graceful degradation. Uh, and then here's one more a painting of a waterfall, and this person said, well, what if we say uh, a, a beautiful painting of a waterfall, and then a very beautiful, and then a very, very, and then a very, 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 and this one is 22 varies. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I'd say those are more beautiful than the other ones. Uh, I don't know if it was worth putting in all 22. Uh, 
but you know, we're going to keep learning these, these kinds of tricks, and the language is going to evolve, the language that we uh, speak to each other with. Uh, and I think that's really interesting. And you know, uh, going back to Vannevar Bush, I, I sort of modeled this talk after him. I admired his work. And one of the things he said was really interesting is he said, well, the speech recognition is coming. Right? So this is 1945. It was not anywhere close. And one of the things he said was, uh, well, some things are going to be harder to understand with speech understanding than other things. So maybe we'll just evolve uh, spoken languages that are easier for speech recognition. And I think, you know, if it was going to take a century for speech recognition to work, that probably would have been a good idea. But, you know, if it's only going to take a decade or so, then it wasn't worth making that change. But I, th I think this idea of thinking about what languages are we going to use to communicate and thinking of this as a partnership. Uh, and, and to some extent, we've already done that with programming languages, right? So the programming languages we have today are kind of this mix of what's good for the compiler to make efficient code and what's good for the programmer to make it easier for them. And we find these languages that are kind of in the sweet spot in the middle. And I think that's what we have to continue to do. But now that we're targeting a language model rather than a, a Python compiler, the languages are going to be very different. Uh, and I think it's going to be really exciting going forward, trying to discover them. But I don't have the answer for where we're going to end up. So why don't we stop there and open it up for discussion. I don't know exactly how this works. There's supposed to be some online stuff. Uh, and uh, and there's microphones here. Uh, so, have at it. So, thank you very much, Peter. Now we have time for a few questions of the public. So, if you want to ask Peter a question, you just come here to the front to the microphones and... We have, we have also questions from the public outside the theater. So maybe, while you think a good question, there's a big one. I cannot see like it that much. OK. So I read it to you from, yep. the, from the public. And then if anybody has another question, you can just come here in the front. So <clears throat> it was done by Coffee Alligator. So <laughs> the space race had the goal of getting a man to the moon. We are in an LLM race that doesn't seem to have a goal other than not losing market. What's your take on this? Is there something we are missing? Is there any pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Yeah. So that's interesting, right? So, uh, I mean, I spent some time at NASA. The space race was certainly long before my time. Uh, my interpretation that the goal of the space race was to show up the Russians. Uh, not right. to land a person on the moon. Are we doing and, the same with the and, LLMs? And, you know, and, and what I've heard is, uh, you know, Kennedy went to NASA and said, can we be the first in orbit? And they said, no, nah, I think we're behind. And then he said, you know, can, can we be the first to send a person or two people into orbit? And he said, no, nah, no, nah, we're still behind. And then he said, well, what can we do first? And they said, well, we don't think the Russians can get to the moon. So he said, let's do that. Okay. <laughs> right? That's the only thing we can win on. Let's play the game we think we can win. Uh, so that's what happened. Uh, and was it worth it? Uh, you know, the geopolitical stuff, I don't know uh, whether trying to compete with the Russians that way was a good idea. Uh, technically, I think it probably was worth it because the whole microcomputer industry was really pushed forward quite a bit uh, because of that. Now, if you had just invested that money directly into the industry rather than also trying to launch rockets, that uh, probably would have been more effective, but there wasn't the political will to do that. So, uh, so that's the history lesson. Uh, now, for today, uh, I think we're doing fine, right? So, yes, there is no one goal, and you know, we have in the popular vocabulary now, we have this notion of uh, moonshots, and uh, companies are always saying, we're doing a moonshot to solve X. Uh, and that's great, and they should be doing that. I don't think we need uh, one answer for saying, here's where the whole field is going. I, I think it's better to explore, right? Because we don't know what the one answer is. And so, 
You know, I talk to lots of companies, and there's companies trying to solve disease, and companies trying to do better agriculture, and uh, trying to do uh, assistance for people with disabilities, and like there's just a hundred different things that they're each doing their own moonshot. Uh, and I think that's fine. We don't we don't need to uh, uh, organize around just one. Yeah, taking like the parallelism with the, what you just said, it's like we can take from other disciplines what you are learning with the large language models for applying to other sciences. So it's yeah. like we are taking the barriers. Yeah. Further. We are pushing the barriers, in fact, of science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so did anyone have like time to think any question or we just say goodbye to Peter? You're so shy. <laughs> I don't bite, I promise. It's like we are here already and yeah. nobody is coming to join us. So we are feeling a little bit lonely with, with Peter, but okay. So thank Peter again. Thank you very much, Peter, okay. for coming here. So now, Omar, are you finally coming to the stage? <laughs> so we found Omar, so he's okay, don't worry about that. And he's going to tell <laughs> us about the Kipu. No, por acá, por acá, Omar. Omar, dale por acá. Porque vamos. Ahí va. Todo tuyo. ¿Tienes el micro? Dale, yo me acuerdo de que está ahí. Hello, everyone. My name, is, my name is Omar Flores. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Te colgamos si te ve, por favor. So, just. Because otherwise, nobody's going to see the equipo. All right. Uh, and now, uh, we're going to talk about Kipu. Now this amazing event that gathers us together to celebrate diversity in AI. But about this other Kipu. Uh, my name is Omar Flores and I am from Peru, where you can find many of these ancient devices. Indeed, archaeologists in the past uh, have been quite um, skeptical about the meaning of them until 1963, where they found 20 of them in one single pot. For the very first time, they had a contextual representation of what kipus meant. In other words, they could correlate information across different kipus, they could contextualize it to the place, and also they could decipher some of the numeric information encoded in kipus. That's why we know now that, for instance, if you take the first thread, you can, for example, see that there are four different levels. The first level starts uh, for one to nine numbers. Indeed, you can multiply the number by one, and you will get a number between uh, one and nine. The second one is the same, uh, but you will multiply by 10. You are right. It's a 10 positional system. Then you will multiply by 100, and finally, you will multiply by 1,000. That's why you can see here probably it's too small, but the number that is encoded is 19, or sorry, 2019. Do you remember what happened in 2019? Yes. It was the first time that we physically had a chance to be together in the first keep. That was an amazing event. Who knew that at that time, pandemic will come and we will have to wait three years and four months to be together again. Uh, that's why, finally, I have the chance to come back to stage again, like three years ago, and the opportunity to encode an additional threat to this Kipu. Uh, this will basically represent 2023. Yes, the second time that we are all together again. So that's exactly what we are going to do. Uh, indeed, this is already uh, information encoded here, so I'm just going to add another knot uh, from 2021 to 2023 in the last uh, numerical representation to represent this amazing event uh, where we are all together. So uh, it's just a, a, a pleasure for me to encode 2023 uh, uh, to represent this moment. And thank you all for coming and also to share and to also know a little bit about 
uh, these amazing uh, numerical representations that are here in Latin America. Uh, something interesting is that uh, this can also be, uh, this can also work in multiple layers. Indeed, you can add the numbers from each of those strings, uh, add them together into one single number, and encode this number into the next kipu. Something like forward propagation, right? Do you remember? <laughs> Sadly, they didn't discover a propagation by then. But indeed, it's kind of a dot product that you do. You consolidate the numbers, you propagate it to the next kipu, and then you can also have multiple layers. We don't need that at least now, but I just want to thank you for letting me encode 2023 in this uh, ancient device from Peru. Thanks. Thank you very much, Omar, for bringing it and sharing the experience. So Omar cannot miss any kibu at all. He has to be coming back and coming back and coming back. <laughs> yes. So now we are going to have our last activity of the, of the evening. We are having the panel Fostering AI in Latin America. So I leave you with Luciana and everybody. Hi everyone, welcome to the roundtable Foster AI in Latin America. This is the final session at KIPU 2023. During this whole week, we learned a lot about what we can develop using artificial intelligence. We had seminars, talks, and practical sessions by researchers and AI practitioners from Latin America and from all over the world. Now, in this final roundtable, we will be talking about how and why we should be fostering AI in Latin America. And also we will talk about who benefits from it. Some of the topics have been put on the table during this week in some of the talks, and in particular by the panel on ethics and social impact that happened yesterday, although it seems a week ago. <laughs> during this panel, the Montevideo Declaration on Artificial Intelligence and its impact in Latin America was shared which brings attention to the risk that AI poses for the region and it states some ethical principles for developing artificial intelligence here in our countries. I am here, we are opening up this discussion to a larger audience in this beautiful place. And we are also inviting this larger community to sign this declaration that was already signed by our panelists which we will share widely after Kipu. To prepare for this roundtable, a few days before coming to Kipu, we send you, the participants, a short survey about the importance of Latin American cultural diversity for fostering AI. The survey was answered by participants from 44 different cities and 13 different Latin American countries, including Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Ecuador, Guatemala, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, and last but not least, Uruguay. This list includes the largest countries in Latin America, but we still have Latin America's countries missing from this list. The countries that are represented uh, host 90% of Latin Americans that live in these countries. The survey asked, why is our Latin American cultural diversity important for artificial intelligence? Many, uh, most of the response stressed the fact that we are culturally very diverse here, that we generate data for artificial intelligence, but we are underrepresented in the development of this area, and that diversity, including our diversity, is crucial for fairness. We will share with you, after Kipu, and after we rest a little bit, uh, there these responses, which are really beautiful to read, written mostly in Spanish and Portuguese. 
the Latin American people behind, behind these responses, you, help me put together the courage and the energy to step into this scenario to moderate this roundtable organized by the Kibu Steering Committee. We hope that this roundtable will be interesting for you. I want to thank you all for responding to this survey. I want to thank the organizing committee from Kipu. This last year has been an amazing journey and I learned a lot. I also want to thank my husband and my daughter because without their encouragement, I wouldn't be here. By thanking them, I want to thank all the families of the Kipu committee. They are helping us achieve our dream of having more Latin Americans thinking about how to develop AI that benefits our communities. And I want to thank the Universidad de la República, the Ban No Te Va a Gustar, and the city of Montevideo that received us with open arms, as Latin Americans know how to do. Public education for improving people's lives is our shared goal. I also want to thank Jocelyn, Peter, Sebastian, and Fabricio for accepting our invitation. I particularly want to acknowledge Peter, who stepped up at the last minute in order to replace Donna, Doina Prekup, who is a professor at the McGill University and heads the Montreal Office of DeepMind. Although, through her, I also want to remember now all the people that had to cancel their participation at Kipu due to caring responsibilities. Not only to take care of their children or parents, but also to take care of themselves, because this area can be too overwhelming sometimes. Jocelyn, Peter, uh, Sebastian and Fabricio all have amazing careers that you can find all the details in the webpage of Kipu. I want now to share a personal thought about their work and about them. Jocelyn is a professor at the Catholic University of Chile. I met Jocelyn a few months ago only, but I already learned so much from her. From her feminist and humanistic view on AI and from her, her tireless work to build AI in Latin America for Latin Americans. Peter is a director of research at Google and is an education fellow at Stanford in the United States. I met Peter's work a very long time ago through his textbook, through his textbook with which I fall in love with artificial intelligence. <laughs> I'm thrilled today to be able to ask more questions. We've already been talking, but thank you. Fabricio Scrollini is the executive director of Open Data Latin American Initiative. I met Fabricio, who is from Uruguay, a few years ago. Every time I interacted with him, I was impressed on how clear and lucid he was while talking about social, political, and economic aspects of AI and the big gap between Latin America and Big Tech. <laughs> Sebastian Barrios is the Vice President of Technology of Mercado Libre. I feel very lucky to meet Sebastian and learn about his views. As a full-time professor myself and as a mom living in a small town in Argentina, I can say that Mercado Libre provides a very useful tool that helps me save time and that was essential for my family during the pandemic. Now let's get to the questions. Each of you will have 10 minutes to address a question from any perspective that you consider relevant and to add information that you think you want to share. So first, Sebastian, which incentives drive the artificial intelligence field in academia, industry and institutions? How are these incentives affecting the development of the field and technologies? What changes do you think are needed or warning rays for the impact in Latin America? Thank you. I'm super happy to, to be here. Uh, incentives are, are a, a great way to, to talk about things. You know, as, as, a, as, a, as a manager myself and, and working with people, working with, with, uh, with my, my son, my, my family, 
we, we always think about incentives. Why are we doing the things that, that, that we do? Uh, in, in Mercado Libre, our, our main incentive is to, to provide a useful service to, to our customers, to, to our users, to our sellers. Uh, thankfully, this is something that, that, that we can charge for. And when, when we align incentives between our business, our investors, our, our, our employees, and, and their families, uh, then it, we, we, we really uh, drive in, in the right direction. I, can't speak myself for 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 the incentives in in academia as I've uh, have a, uh, I had a very long uh, stay in, in in school. Uh, it took me a while to to get my undergraduate, but that's that's about it. I, I uh, feel like I'm the 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 least qualified person here uh, to speak about about academia. But I can speak uh, of what what I've learned about uh, human nature, you know, and, and and stories about about academia, you know, and and the 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 desire to to live better lives. The desire to to uh, compete as well. No, there there are some great examples of of, of research that happened. Uh, for example, the the double helix uh, structure of, of of DNA and all the competition uh, around that. Scientists wanted to publish before their their enemy or, or their 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 nemesis. That is also a friend. No, but in in in, uh, in, in a sense, what what drives us forward as uh, as as humans, as companies, as as employees, I think is is is, is rather. Similar, no, and and in, in Mercado Libre, that pushes us really strongly into artificial intelligence because it's a great tool that helps us uh, further provide better services to, to, to our users. We use it from uh, routing our, our, our deliveries to uh, estimating what recommendations our, our, our users are, are most likely to, to enjoy. You know? And, and uh, even from the, the perspective of, OK, you're, you're doing it to, to sell more things. No? Uh, yes, but hopefully the, these recommendations are relevant uh, and, 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 and things that make the, the lives of, of our users better. Uh, I think the, the, the second part of the question was more about how, how this relates to, to Latin America and, and I'll, I'll branch off the question just a little bit uh, because I, I feel like a lot of what we bring to the table from Latin America and, and it's something that, that happens at Mercado Libre as well. No? So we, we are uh, unfortunately, I would say, unique in being such a large technology company in, in, in Latin America. I wish there, there, there were more and I, I see changes in the ecosystem that, that are helping us uh, make this happen. But we have unique perspectives of, of the world, as do people from, from all countries, right? But the fact that, that, that we've lived different experiences, that, that we approach problems from, from different ways. We benefit very greatly in, in Mercado Libre, for example, for having 13 different offices. So we, we have people working from all over Latin America that understand problems that, for example, for me, are, are, are difficult to, to understand how shipping or, or logistics should work in, in Chile. There are obviously things that, that you can generalize, but if you have people on the ground that, that even use your product, that, that, that care about it, uh, that can drive it forward, you're going to get a lot better results than if you try to design a, a, a program through a committee that is going to come up with a, a global solution. Uh, so I think that applies to both our, our, our products and uh, how we develop and, and, and achieve or, or improve artificial intelligence from, from Latin America. Great. And uh, what kind of something else that the question was mentioning is some warnings or some risks that you see associated so th as we talked through through lunch, uh, I'm a very optimistic person. So I tend to focus on on on, on all the positive and and all the access, for example, that that that, that is opening up. Just one, one of the talks today was uh, around languages, no, and 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 the barriers that 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 can bring to to people. So when when people ask for for, for advice for me on hey, how can I uh, launch my career forward? How can, how can I improve? Uh, one of the first things I recommend, uh, unfortunately, again, is to get good at reading English and, and, and understanding because most of the text out there, most of the documentation, uh, most of the, 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 the great books, some of them are translated. Uh, but if you can uh, break that barrier into, okay, I, I can read and, and, and speak English, you're going to get a lot more opportunities to, to explore. And, and thankfully, that, that's changing. No? One, one of the things that these uh, models are really good at is, is translation. They, they can even translate uh, plain text into code. So translating from, from one language to, to another actually turns out to be 
even simpler than than, than that. So lowering the the, the barrier uh, on on an access to, to all that knowledge that that's already out there actually see a lot more positive things coming from 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 AI than 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 negatives or, or risks. But I'm also aware of, of of the risks, and again, that's why I I, I call out my bias towards optimism. Uh, but I invite you to hit back with with uh, tough questions, and we'll we'll address them. Great. Uh, so, uh, with I will move to the next question now for Jocelyn, uh, that is related to this one regarding. Uh, what actions in the short, medium, and long term do you think are necessary for Latin America to play an active role in research and development in its territory on these issues? And how do you think that the current big players could contribute to make this happen? Like Mercado yeah. Libre? <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, the short and the immediate uh, action is to keep Kipu. You know, like, don't drop it, don't... We, we should, uh, I don't know, in Spanish you say, like, como, hay que agarrar equipo, como que, I really think that this is a great conference. I, I haven't talked to anyone that don't tell me, like, I love Kipo. I cannot understand how great people, <laughs> famous people are coming. We, the students are like, I didn't have to pay anything, and I'm staying in the hotel with the professors. It's like, it's too good to be true. So I think that uh, we should find a way <laughs> to keep, like, the know-how for the next organizers and to like keep our differences in a way that we keep Kipu like that's the main goal is beyond us is just for the next generations it's not just for us that maybe we go to conferences but I think that having a conference this level in, in, a, in a country in Latin America just bring like artificial intelligence like a step higher so I think that we all agree that we like this conference so we should keep it okay <laughs> And, and talking about conferences, I think that we all agree that, that like seeing each other, like talking, like being able to not just send an email to someone, but like to be able to talk in a, in a coffee break or like the party in last night is so, is so like productive. Um, and I think that we know that coming from Latin America means that every conference that is in the North Globe it's so expensive to go. You know, like if it's a conference in Croatia or Japan, it's like super, hyper expensive for us. And also the, com the conference fees are very expensive. So sometimes myself, like I get a grant that I don't pay the conference fees, but I still have to find a way to travel. And okay, I'm a professor. I, okay, I can find a way to go. But what about my students? Like at the most I can find my PhD student to go once to a conference. And I would like him to have the same opportunity I had when I was a PhD student in England. So conferences are important and we have to find a way uh, to fund those travels. And that's, that's why diversity committees in conferences I find so important. But in order that they work as they should do, and I have the experience from the Association of Computational Linguistics, the ACL, there is a power in voting, you know, like diversity is something like many people, like a political statement, like, yeah, we believe in diversity, but I would like to invite you, if you do natural language processing, if you go to one ACL conference, you can vote the whole year. So if we want to be like very picky, when there is an election, we could send an email and ask like, what do you think about diversity? How are you going to make actions that we in Latin America, we feel that like Spanish has a place in the ACL? You know, and then we and then we vote for the person that uh, has a, a, not just a political statement, but more like, yeah, I have actions. Actually, I went to Latin America last year. Actually, I have a paper with someone from Uruguay or whatever. Okay, so I believe in that. And I was talking with with Peter that for me, it's so strange this idea of like having a two hours flight to a conference. Like we used to have like a day off. Um, so that's. <laughs> I forgot to say that that's what I love about Kipu, is that for us it's a short flight and for the rest it's a long flight. <laughs> okay, and about the medium action, those were the, uh, the, the immediate actions, you know. You can start voting and trying to, to make politics in science now. But about the medium, and it's about language, and 
Sebastian was just mentioning like the English, the importance of English, and I think that um, it's something that we should talk more because especially in Latin America and have the, the Chilean perspective, speaking English has a lot to do with the money that you had when you were a child. So it's not so easy, like, yeah, just get English, you know, because the, the richer people just speak very nicely. So they, those, they should not have a lot more opportunities that they already have. Um, so I find that, um, of course, I mean, I teach, a, oh, I'm going to teach a course of how to write papers, because like, I really want my students to write in English, because they go to big conferences, whatever. So there is a medium thing that has to do with the language in both ways, like, yeah, try to improve your English. If you can get a course, take it. If you can write better in English, do it. Do it, uh, things with Grammarly or whatever, like find, find a way to, to improve that, that skill. But also we could argue, like, do we need to speak English all the time in Kipo? You know, that's a question. And thanks for all the applauses, you know. And yeah, I think that there is technology for having a translation in the whisper, you know, like, because we also have the Portuguese, and sorry for the, for the people from Brazil that I keep saying Spanish, Chile Spanish, but I know, it's, there is Portuguese as well, and I think that we, I mean, it, it is not so hard to have a translation, and maybe, maybe next people we could have like a, like a session in, in the language where the speaker wants to speak, you know? And uh, in terms of um, the long term, okay, um, I find that uh, that is hard sometimes to to get to power uh, from Latin America. Like I I do NLP for medicine, and sometimes I get excited like oh there is a new uh, journal from the artificial intelligence from the New England of medicine. They they're super good. And I look at the boarding, the, the, the editorial boarding, and it's all Stanford, MIT, or whatever. Like, it's, it's, so, it's so United States that I feel like, okay, we have to do... The problem is that when you send a paper or something, like, many times that the rejection comes from saying our, our readers are not so interested in Latin American issues, you know? Um, so we have to get that thing, and for example, Luciana is making a lot of fight in the ACL, um, but it takes time, you know, like we have Luciana, Luciana gets tired sometimes, and <laughs> some people get, have to get there, you know, but in order to get to the power, you have to have like good publications, you have to publish like a lot, you know, so it won't happen overnight, but we have to fight. We have to find those uh, spaces and, and get it. And also I find like very nice how you can have like people from abroad that supports Latin America. Like I was very excited when I saw uh, Sammy Benjo last, uh, yesterday with the America Invertida t-shirt. Did you notice? And it was like, yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so then you find like, oh, those people like really believe that Latin America is a nice place to make collaborations, that there are nice problems and they like to travel here. So I think that that's, that's nice to make, to make a, a group of people that like stand up for us. And finally, um, uh, I wanted to say something more. Um, and there is a, a, a small thing about the, the ACL again that the, um, the name for our like I don't know our conference is called NACL, which is the North American Association of Computational Linguistics. So, so as a Latin American myself, like how is NACL going to represent me? So I'm trying to start a movement that is trying to change the name from NACL to PACL like Pan American <laughs> Association of Computational Linguistics. And my plan is to, in the next knuckle, uh, put in the slides, puckle, puckle, and put a, <laughs> like a hashtag in Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So, thanks. I like puckle. And uh, <laughs> also, uh, I wanted to say that if you are maybe later in your career, voting is very important, as Jocelyn said, but if you are later in your career uh, and if you want to propose yourself as a member of the Executive Com Committee of the Natural Language Processing Association, I would be very happy to pass on <laughs> the torch. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so now Peter. 
Um, so my question for you is, what do you think is the value of academic artificial intelligence versus industry artificial intelligence for our context? Uh, and how could they work together? Uh, how to change this versus with the width, maybe, coming from your experience, uh, and also if you can imagine other realities also. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. And I first, I want to say I, I agree with Rosalind. Uh, Kipo is great, and, and I don't mind the long flight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we owe you one, right? Uh, so this is a tough question of uh, uh, academics in versus industry. And we are at this phase now where scale seems to matter. And big companies have big budgets, and they can build big things. And some of those things universities just can't. Uh, and so that's a, bi a bit of a barrier. Uh, but it's not really something new, right? For a century now, universities have had departments of civil engineering, and they never build skyscrapers, uh, right? So they participate in, in a different way, and yet they're very useful. And so I, I think there's lots of things that uh, universities can do that the companies are not doing and that's useful and they, they should keep doing it. Um, so like the civil engineers, they could work on setting standards. Uh, they can take time to analyze some of the things that the, the companies are doing where they're just saying, we're trying to push ahead we're not really going to explain how it works. Uh, academics make, can be better at that. Uh, benchmarking and, and comparing uh, uh, different results. Uh, that's something that uh, academia can do. Um, I expect that in the future we'll see more of the big cloud providers uh, trying to compete to, with their large language models and, and, and other kinds of uh, complex software offerings. So it won't just be how, ma how many dollars per CPU hour uh, is it. It'll be what are these complex offerings. And I expect that they will want to uh, give discounts or grants to universities. So it may be getting better in terms of being able to do larger experiments in the university uh, th through these cloud uh, facilities. Um, then in, in terms of where is the leading research, uh, you know, if you count up the number of papers at uh, NeurIPS, the, the major machine learning conference, uh, I think last year uh, Google had the most papers, but certainly the uh, universities had more papers overall than all the big tech companies. So uh, it's not concentrated in a few places, but it's spread out uh, everywhere. And I think that's important because you get uh, different points of view. Uh, now in terms of uh, collaboration, uh, the, the companies all need uh, graduates from the university and, and that's going to continue. Uh, they need them when they graduate, they need them uh, as interns. Uh, we're in a bit of a rough period right now with the recession and some of the big companies overreaching and having layoffs now rather than hiring, uh, but that'll snap back. And, and so uh, there'll be that opportunity for the, uh, the companies to, to come to the universities with funding and, and uh, wanting to uh, support them uh, going forward. Uh, so, so I think you know, both entities play a really important role in, in pushing the whole ecosystem forward, and, and I'm, I'm happy with the way it works. Maybe adding the, the perspective of, of, of a Latin American company, uh, and because we, we, we have such a, a diverse audience, you'd be surprised that we uh, are not a, a approached that often for, from researchers in, in, in Latin America. Uh, maybe they, they see us as, as having our, our, our doors closed, uh, but it, it's nothing like that. We, uh, we publish very, very uh, focused things on, on, on our business rather than very uh, general research, but 
take this as, as an invitation if, if, if you have a, a project that you think we can help with or, or, or something that could be helpful for us. We're uh, always looking for, for new people, new ideas, new ways to, to, to collaborate. We uh, have relationships with multiple universities and, and organizations and we're working on, 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 on making them stronger. So, yeah, happy to, to receive any inbound uh, ideas on, on, on how to improve this in Latin America. I will definitely take that invitation and knock on your door again because <laughs> I already went a couple of times <laughs> before. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hopeful that this time will work. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, so to our last speaker of this round, Fabricio, uh, what do you think of the following statement? Market-led digital innovation has, led, has been driving unprecedented private wealth generation using data from people that do not get money out of it. Muchísimas gracias, Luciana. Bienvenidas, sean bienvenidos, sean bienvenidas a Teatro Solís. So this theater, this is our amazing, uh, small but beautiful theater here in, in Uruguay. Uh, this is the main stage, kindly supported by Uruguayan taxpayers and taxes. Taxes are complex, right? So um, the first thing about the question you ask is, um, A, was this market-led? I mean, this industry that you are building has a lot of incentives offered by governments across the world, um, essentially to drive the industry forward. And such incentives uh, have so far been successful. Uh, you know, most of the technology that you are actually standing on uh, is built on the shoulders of giants, to say the least. I mean, it's built on a technology that was developed initially as part of grants that were coming from, you know, different kind of governments across the world. That means taxpayers. Um, so, yes, I mean, uh, it is market-led in this incarnation, but in previous incarnations, uh, let's say, this was supported by uh, public money, and that's perfectly fine. That's what we want public money for, to support and develop new industries. Um, and so as a result, this is a, a question we now need to ask, how and if, uh, we are going to get some of this uh, development and some of this, uh, let's say, um, uh, evolution uh, into ways that actually support uh, the development of public infrastructure that's also needed for this, f for this field to move forward. Uh, and also for theaters, because they're nice, and we want actually theaters that work, and they're open for conferences like this one. My understanding is that the city of Montevideo kindly offer this place uh, as a gift to Kipo, so they can uh, mingle here together all the researchers from this continent. Um, the second problem or issue with the question is that at least, as is, I would say a bunch of research currently says that people don't really care that much about their data. So they will sell it for a very low price. So this is the equivalent of saying, hey, people don't care that much about their rights. <laughs> it's just, yeah, well, you wouldn't be surprised. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so we are not going to do that research. Uh, the, the critical element, though, is to think about uh, from a more, I will say, um, systemic perspective and, and trying to understand that uh, we live, obviously, in a very unequal world, and that's the rule of the game. Most, as uh, our colleague in the ethics panel, um, I think it's Dr. Lucioni, Dr. Sajia Lucioni was mentioning yesterday, um, most of the models are trained, you know, in the Global North with databases that came from the Global North, and that's perfectly fine. I mean, that's where the data was, you know, it's not, it's not a judgment there, like you had to do something, right? The issue there is like, if you want to apply those models globally, well, then we have a problem. And the first thing to consider is that where this data is coming from and under which conditions are going, is going to be, let's say, um, you know, uh, obtained. And to do that, uh, that's the complex part, because at the moment we don't have 
you know, an understanding of how this process should be uh, actually should be done. So, so we have a lot of experimentation in the wild. We have a large uh, regulator around the world setting up rules in, you know, in some sort of Mount Olympus where everyone might need to go to obtain the law. Uh, we now have, and we have the Latin American countries, which, you know, they seem not to agree on, on how to do that. And we need to reflect on how to actually do this so we can, let's say, get a, a fair data deal for all these peoples that uh, essentially, to some degree, are contributing to the development of science. Uh, and and to, to do that, basically, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, an art to, to do that in a sense that we need the support and the data to keep this uh, field going forward. But we also need to follow certain rules that will ensure that human dignity and human rights are respected. And this is part of the call that uh, a lot of members in, in, in Kipu are actually putting forward in a declaration. Uh, it's part of what they are putting forward in a declaration out there uh, about you know, this particular worry. Uh, and I think it's a valid one. And, and you know, it's not to pass judgment on, on what has been done before because that, you know, that's just not, uh, you know, that would be unuseful because otherwise we wouldn't have uh, gotten to this point in which we are able to discuss this. But we need to be aware that in this continent, some very strange thing happens, like people trying to predict teenage pregnancies um, out of very, very biased data sets in Argentinian provinces, like knocking on your door telling that your daughter might be pregnant, and we come from the government to tell you that. Pause for a bit. If you're a parent, think of that. If you're not a parent, think that, you know, you are the daughter. <laughs> that, and a government official is showing up at your door because some machine learning model uh, you know, uh, is telling them that. By the way, training the worst possible biased data set ever, right? Because it was only trained on data sets that were coming from, you know, very, very, very uh, impoverished neighborhoods. Because obviously rich people, you know, they don't get pregnant. Like teenage, <laughs> teenage, teenage, teenage rich girls don't get pregnant, right? So, so that's the problem that we are facing. I think that connects quite nicely as well with, with some of the needs and incentives we need to get here. Um, and the alignment of incentives between markets and governments, uh, I think is quite evident in some areas. Like, we need better data deals and better, data, better sorry, data sharing agreements uh, so we can run, actually, uh, you know, uh, good research under uh, safe conditions. And that's something that is at hand as long as everyone collaborates, not only, you know, in, in testing them, but actually in setting up the grounds for doing that. And I think Latin America has a, a good history in terms of, of, of uh, experimental regulation to some degree. Uh, but also, you know, I think that, that there's a certain community of values uh, here that could be uh, actually put uh, in place uh, to, to essentially, you know, uh, drive this kind of uh, experimentation and this kind of regulation forward. So we can actually have, and this is the crucial element here, like Latin Americans can be at the cutting edge of this technology, whether, you know, as the, as the, you know, as the engineers driving forward the technology, but maybe also as business, uh, you know, showing and performing the way this kind of business should be done with the right values, with the right um, delivery. And, you know, and I think that's the potential for many Latin American companies uh, to show there is a better way. And, you know, who knows, you know, some of you could set up one, uh, or some of you could actually be the CTO of that one. And the machine learning field will boom. I think we, we heard it today, uh, and there's uh, evidence that, that this is happening. So if Latin Americans are going to take a place there, which, which will be that place? And I think in this declaration, there is a bit of a call, basically, to, to take that role uh, in a reflective way. And finally, I think I got one minute, uh, the... Um, the final element here is like, uh, to, to do all this, we need governments that are, to some degree, understanding what is going on. That's not the case today. <laughs> so, so our efforts and your efforts as, as, you know, as technical leads to communicate, to engage, are very, very important and, and will remain very important uh, in the years to come. We are also, unfortunately, not operating under, um, let's say, uh, uh, usual circumstances. Our democracies are divided. Uh, we are facing, to some degree, challenges to 
basic human rights in some countries. So some of these technologies in some of these particular domains are now, you know, particularly complex to implement. So post for a bit, well, you know, when some of these technologies are being implemented, and to see, like the most notable case is obviously facial recognition, but you will find other cases. And as a, as a result, it's important to think about the role as a technical community uh, that you will play uh, in the years to come. So thank you very much for such a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> you were extremely brave <laughs> to take it. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, you were brave to take it but you also left very hard homework for the people, right? I mean, you said you just need to, to get better data sharing agreements and you have to make an effort to communicate with policymakers. <laughs> I'm happy to play the in-between role as usual, but <laughs> I will be here. <laughs> so uh, in this, um, I like this idea of uh, leaving homework, maybe because I'm a professor. Uh, Jocelyn also gave us some homework uh, to keep organizing people <laughs> as a community. So, I mean, probably some future organizer is sitting around here. <laughs> um, and um, Sebastian also gave us the, uh, the offer to knock on Mercados Libre door. Um, so, in the second round, and, and keeping in mind uh, particular recommendations for, for us, and for everyone here. Um, this question is going to be shared by Sebastian and by Peter. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you also to think about possible homeworks <laughs> there. Uh, so the question is, um, and you will have five minutes each to address it. Considering that Latin Americans are currently underrepresented in AI development, but use AI intensively and contribute their data. Uh, how important do you think uh, AI is for the present and future of Latin America? So, so I guess the first thing to say is uh, being here at this conference and hearing all the presentations, uh, it didn't feel like it's special in a Latin American way. It felt like uh, everybody here was very professional, they knew what they were talking about, and they were participating in the field as a whole. Uh, yeah, but this is so, a very rare event. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this doesn't reflect the rest <laughs> of, uh, of everything. Yeah. Um, so one thing I can say is uh, about 15 years ago this phrase uh, came up of saying uh, data is the new oil, meaning uh, data is a raw resource which needs to be refined and then it becomes valuable. And there's something to that that makes sense, but there's also something that's completely wrong because oil is something that's uh, fungible and if it comes from Norway or Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter. You can still put it in your car and it'll work. Uh, but data is not like that at all. Uh, data it tends to be local. Uh, and uh, the most obvious aspect of that is for you computational linguists. Uh, if I have a big database of English, uh, that doesn't help you do Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, and, uh, but it's more than that as well. It's not just the language. It's everything about the culture, uh, about the environment, the weather, the agriculture. Uh, everything is local. Uh, your data is different and you're the stewards of it. Uh, and uh, it's up to you to, to make the value from it. Uh, and that can't be done outside. Maybe it can be done in some kinds of partnerships, uh, but that's where uh, the, the value is. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of what we can do and, uh, you know, a suggestion, uh, I think the main thing is to invest in educating the next generation. Uh, and. So as you said, uh, we have a great set of people here at this conference, but we have to keep that pipeline coming and we have to say uh, who's going to be next up and, and hopefully there'll be more of them next time around and that will continue. Uh, so I've been very happy and proud throughout this week to meet several people who said that they uh, took my online class back in uh, 2011 
And at that time, th there weren't that many resources available. Uh, and so that was one of the few things that they could do. They didn't have access to uh, Stanford or at MIT, uh, and they could go online and get that. Now there's many more resources. And so I think trying to, to uh, normalize, trying to uh, uh, scale up your skills by taking advantage of, uh, of whatever is out there, I think that's another challenge. That's great. And also a great recommendation to share your knowledge everywhere you go, like give a talk or uh, even if you think you, uh, you are just starting. I think, uh, I mean, uh, Peter was teaching a course to more than 100,000 people, uh, but uh, we can start small. So I was one of the students yeah. that, that uh, <laughs> was uh, absolutely transformed by, by that and, and, and other courses. In my case, it was uh, more, more specific. Like I took your course and it was amazing. I also took the, the developing mobile apps course, uh, which was free online. Uh, I already knew how to program a little bit, even I would say. Uh, and, and that was enough for me to, to create my, my first application. Uh, it actually became the, the luckily, uh, that was my, my first try, <laughs> uh, the most downloaded application in Mexico for, for, for a while. Uh, and taking these, these, these courses literally changed my life. Uh, I am 100% sure of it. So absolutely uh, making, making more of that happen. And again, I, I, uh, my relentless optimism on, on how all these new tools and all these things that, 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 that are happening, I feel are, are, are lowering the, the, the barriers that opposed the, the, the development of new things, the, the development of, of talent. Language was one of them that, that I feel like that is uh, something that, that, that is constantly dropping and more things appear in, in, in Spanish and Portuguese and other languages, but also the, the ability to, to translate everything changes. More people also have access to learning new languages using these tools. Uh, so I think that, that that is absolutely amazing. On the other hand, uh, one, one of the things that I've seen lacking in, in, in Latin America is actually ambition. Uh, so if, if, if I had to, to, to describe the main differences I see when, when, when I travel to the United States that has developed uh, all these uh, amazing things, it's, they have optimism, uh, but they are incredibly uh, unbounded by the things that they want to accomplish. Oh, you, 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 you want to go to the moon and, and, and you get there. Uh, you, you want to do things and, and, and you accomplish them and you set really, really audacious goals. Uh, that also requires being very, very sure of yourself, sometimes even too much. Uh, but it, it, it's definitely something that I think we, we, we can uh, learn as a, as a people in, in, in Latin America because the talent is there. I, I, I know it firsthand. Uh, we've seen it here at the at the conference. But again, I I, I come from a, a very large technology company that employs mostly uh, Latin American engineers, data scientists, designers, and and we compete and 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 uh, are better than many of our global competitors. And our our technology is absolutely at the the world class. Uh, it is even surprising to 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 some people when we do demos and, and, and show what we're doing. Uh, obviously, there, there are stereotypes that, that, that need to be broken because like, wow, I had no idea that technology like this was, was being developed in, in, in Latin America. And so uh, the, the, the talent is there. The, the resources are mostly there uh, for free for, for, for anyone to, to explore and, and, and take. So I think having the, the, the ambition and the audacity to strive for, for, for greater things is something that uh, we can all work on and, and, and improve on. And uh, it's going to sound very cheesy and, and inspirational, but you have to believe in yourself. You're amazingly talented, and there are almost no things that, that, that you couldn't accomplish if, if you put your mind to it. OK, great. So we have two homeworks from here. Invest in educating the next generation and have more ambition. <laughs> um, OK, so. The next question is shared by uh, by Jocelyn and Fabricio, uh, and it's a short one. I hope it's a simpler one. <laughs> what tax aspects of AI do you think require a specific Latin American perspective? Like, 
So we, we do it the other way around because we like to change. Yes, yes we like change. <laughs> yes, we, do. we still want to keep your attention. Like the, I think there are three things I would say that Latin America can bring to the table here. A, the amazing diversity that is actually here in this room because the organizers have done an amazing job trying to reflect that diversity in Latin America. And as such, we need kind of to respect that diversity and include that diversity. Again, one of the points that uh, this group of um, researchers are calling for uh, to respect, to protect that diversity, uh, not only the language uh, diversity, which obviously you can feel the Spanish, the Portuguese, but think also about uh, the Aymara and so on. Like we have a bunch of languages in Latin America that need to be included uh, and respected. Uh, and not only respected as well, like uh, potentially used them as well to innovate and to create and to show the, the great potential that they have. So that diversity is also a, a call, an echo for other regions in the world to think about how they will uh, include diversity in, as a value, as a, as a thing to protect, to celebrate. Uh, and as a result, something that will turn your models a bit more difficult to t tune. You know, that's, that's a trade-off, I'm afraid. <laughs> but um, on, on, on the other hand, uh, the, the other element that I think Latin America brings is because of our difficult past, because of our, um, you know, uh, unfortunate political incidents in the past, we also bring with us a human rights background, and, and this is something we learn basically through the most uh, painful lessons uh, that a country can actually have. And because of those painful lessons, we might want to remember those for the future and make sure that the, you know, whatever regulation we end up adopting actually enshrines and protects the you know, basic dignity uh, of people. Uh, and so when these uh, you know, machine learning tools are out there and scale and become uh, you know, part of our normal life or part of the way our government operates, our rights will be, you know, protected. And um, I think this, this crowd actually understands that. Hopefully it's something very obvious to you. But it's not very obvious for a lot of people out there. And that's the challenge. And the third element I think Latin America brings is actually a lot of talent and, and, and passion that needs actually uh, to be supported. And as, as Peter said, like, uh, you know, to, to actually train uh, this new generation who hopefully will actually, you know, learn from you as well about the ethical values they will push forward. Um, and, and that's amazing. That's a, a huge opportunity that the region has. Uh, and for that, obviously, you know, you are going to need universities, but much more than universities. Uh, and, and, and the critical element as well there is see how, uh, you know, the private sector, the public sector, uh, the civil society can actually al align themselves uh, to actually, you know, um, build uh, this new generation as well. Okay, talking about passion and drama, uh, I want to talk about language. And, and you know, like, every time someone in Chile is doing a thesis in English, I feel like a, like a I don't know, like a, a cat cries inside. Because I think that, I mean, there are so many work on, I, I, I don't know, from the clinical point of view, that this mimic data set. So many theses around the world. Like, I understand that you really want to try this cool bird on this thing in English, but is it really helping someone? Like, I don't think. I mean, well, I don't want to be more, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to be provocative, you know, go ahead and do the thesis in English. But at least to me, I find much more fun at least trying to translate mimic in a nice way to Spanish or Portuguese and do something, do transfer learning, federated learning, whatever. Find a way to use the nice data set in your own language and help someone in your own country, okay? So um, I find that, um, so the, the topic of language I think is very important and I was in EMNLP last December and you know, we, many people speak Spanish and you will think, oh yeah, it's the second country represented in hugging face models. But the, the graph is terrible because it's like, models that they are in high phase for language is like English and then the second is Spanish but it's here it's like English Spanish you know um, so I wonder like I think that we have to push like we have our languages and guys in which moment you are going to get tired of the English and you will focus in other languages like languages other than English so I was thinking maybe we should try to find like a best paper award for diversity or like best paper that is not 
in English. Like, like try to find a way to motivate people that like other le like languages other than English are fun and are, they have challenges and maybe like push more the shared task, invite like Chinese to like compete in a name entity recognition in Spanish, whatever, like that kind of things. I think that, I mean, I'm giving homeworks, but anyway. So languages is nice and I have to say this, I'm, I'm using the moment of fame to say like, I know, let's think about Shakira, okay? So the idea, <laughs> the idea of like, oh, I, I speak, I, I, I come from Colombia, I, 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 I speak in Spanish, and then I move to the English market, like the American market, and I start to listen, I like listening in, in, in English. But Shakira is now like the record, everything, the worldwide the most listened Spotify artist in Spanish, you know? So there is something about our languages. It's not like the end story is the English. You know, like otherwise it will be very easy. Like we all come at some moment to speak English and we, and we succeed there. But no, like everybody likes Shakira now. Okay, I'm not going to sing. And, <laughs> and finally, like some, I mean, just to say two more things about like this Latin American perspective that we need in artificial intelligence. I think images are, are huge. And because I have from the clinical point of view, also created data sets for myeloma that consider the skin that we have. Uh, and also have a time to make it like very nicely on the gender desegregation and put women and non-binary people in the data set is a nice way to do it right. Um, so yeah, images. And finally, I find that there are some topics of problems that affect other countries that are not the states or not Europe that should be taken in account. At some moment, I talked to someone in Apple because I was saying, you know, I think that the Apple Watch could detect rape. And it's just that you don't have the diverse team to, to recognize that. So I find like if, I mean, and maybe it's because the team is not diverse enough to say, okay, I mean, how it can be that it can detect so many things of my running, you know, and it cannot detect if I'm in, pro in troubles, you know? So I think that uh, that's also something that I would like to see more, like how can we use this nice, super fancy model for something that really affects us? And I don't think that it has to come from like someone uh, from Boston do a, like a field trip in Chile or in Uruguay or whatever, uh, asking questions like, what problem do you have, you know? Or can I take a photo of your skin? It's like, we are here, you know, we are not invisible. Like, we are researchers in Latin America that, that can bring these questions and challenges and try the other people to help us solving them. I mean, and also they can give us GPUs and we solve it ourselves, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um... Okay, now uh, we have some. We have time for questions from the public that we received through the link that was shared with you this morning uh, with the daily email. Um, so um, I have a question that I thought it might be a good match for Peter. So since you were talking about education, the question is: uh, How can we make the Latin do you have ideas on how to make the Latin American worldview more central in the technology creation processes? Uh, in technology creation, they mean ideation, development, and deploy. Uh, and they say technology produced elsewhere may have a culture match problems, as you were saying with oil and, uh, and data. And I think that's a good idea, and I, I think it's not uh, just a Latin American problem. I, th yeah. I think that's everywhere. Exactly. That we've tended to build systems for the majority and ignore uh, minority points of view. Um, and I think people are starting to uh, wake up to that and starting to uh, try to build systems that are more diverse, pay more attention to different use cases. Uh, we are quite a lar mi large minority here. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so, so I think we're going in the right direction for that. I think, uh, you know, there's an awareness that you can't just make uh, one size fits all. Uh, and you, you have to start uh, paying more attention to, to studying things, these things. So, so I think we're on the right track. Um, 
and there, there is an issue of, uh, of machine learning uh, kind of perpetuating this problem uh, because there's uh, two reasons why you might see worse service for, for some subgroup. Uh, one is that nobody's paying attention to them and, and they don't even try to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is uh, you try to do something uh, but the smaller groups have less data and the bigger groups have uh, more data. So even if you try to do the best job you can, uh, machine learning doesn't uh, operate as well. So, uh, so that's the kind of issue we see in the, in the U.S. Uh, when we're trying to build products that serve minority groups there. Uh, but here, you should be able to overcome that. You know, you should say, uh, "Well, uh, Spanish speakers were the majority, right? We don't, we don't have that problem, but we just have to have the the will to say, this is how we're, we're going to build our products, and we're going to pay attention to this." Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, there's another one that I hope is not too hard. <laughs> But <laughs> um, there is always talk of IA scientists and developer about other. Um, there's always talk about artificial intelligence by scientists and by developers from industry. But other alternatives and form of organization around artificial intelligence are much less frequent. In Argentina, there is an artificial intelligence cooperative uh, and some projects encourage this kind of non-academic communities uh, to propose developments. So how, what can we do in order to encourage more of these initiatives that are not necessarily coming from industry or academia uh, and uh, that is not something only for the elites? I mean, implying that academia and, and, and industry are the leads. So that was not tough. Actually, I have evidence <laughs> on that. <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so in our program, Empatia, we actually encounter uh, a small cooperative in Argentina, uh, and they work with us actually anonymizing uh, data sets coming out of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is important because judicial records should be open, so essentially everyone can access to the law and to the decisions. But also, they shouldn't be that open that you know private details of the individuals are out there and potentially risk their lives or their honor or you know whatever other thing. And so that was done by a small cooperative uh, in partnership with the university in, uh, in Argentina. And, and in order to do that, they also had to tag a lot of um, data. You know, tagging was very extensive. And that was done by a cooperative of, of trans workers, actually, you know, working with them. Um, and the beauty of the story is actually that we had no idea these people existed. And, and because we now were able to see them, we we're also able to support them. Uh, and this is just one story, like we engage also civil society organizations in Brazil, uh, essentially looking at uh, how the public budget is executed. And, you know, developing basic algorithms to detect anomalies in the public budget and essentially guide policymakers to, you know, where to do, what to do, how to do it, or potential cases of corruptions, which we also found. Um, but it's not for this, <laughs> for this panel. <laughs> like, the, the, the critical element here is that machine learning technologies um, can potentially be adapted to this uh, kind of new enterprises or inclusive enterprises or new ways of doing business, if you want, with a social purpose or with a more uh, public-oriented purpose. Uh, and, and, this, uh, and this is there. And I think that the research agencies, like the local research agencies, uh, like ANI, uh, CONICETS, and others, uh, could be doing more, essentially, to provide those links and also to provide also meaningful work and meaningful engagement for uh, the academia and for the business themselves in this. Uh, so there is room, basically, for a more democratic AI, basically. Maybe not as sophisticated as some of the stuff you have been discussing here. That's a fair point, but it's still useful. And, and you know, there's a trade-off as well between sophistication and something useful. And sometimes a simple solution is much better than 6,000 parameters that, to some degree, you don't really know how they work. So, so that's, this is something I learned um, across this conference. <laughs> so, so like the, the element there is, is uh, the potential is there. And that's where public investment can actually make uh, certainly a difference. 
Okay, so you think that uh, the world is ready to have more of these cooperatives? And, uh... Indeed, and it's a different way because of a different ethos in the way they organize and the way they do business. It's also a way of en to enrich the AI ecosystem. Not only in Latin America, it plays, uh, it, it's a bigger, uh, let's say, role, but, but Latin America is fertile ground for this kind of economic units. Mm -hmm. Uh, 6,000 parameters is a tiny number. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Um, this question is for Sebastian. Uh, so, do you think that we could achieve a Latin American plan for AI besides governments making plans for each country? I mean, what role should companies play in making a, a Latin American plan for AI, in particular your company? I feel like that's a tough question because whenever you start talking about sort of like more centralized power and, 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 and governments and uh, who is, who, who's making that decision, uh, there is no Latin American Union, uh, mm -hmm. although I personally think it would be a, a great idea to help us uh, really uh, get along better with each other. But from even the, the, the corporate perspective, uh, there's so many different regulations, so many different laws, so many different tiny variations from, from one country to, to, to another where having a, a more uh, normalized environment uh, would actually encourage more businesses to, to, to be able to, to grow. So there's always, uh, trade-offs and, 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 and things that are uh, more dangerous when, when you centralize more power or, or when you have uh, super governments that, that uh, sit on top of, of, of other governments. But, I mean, currencies and, and uh, I, I won't get into that. I'll, I'll, I'll get into what maybe companies can, can, can do for, mm -hmm. for that to happen because we do uh, operate all across Latin America and uh, our, our machine learning teams building uh, machine learning models, a AI solutions are throughout Latin America. Uh, I'm more of a believer in um, decentralization and more than uh, a plan. That, that, that's also why I wanted to, to, to talk about incentives. Uh, I think it's hard to plan for, for, for innovation or, or, or uh, try to force things to, to happen. For me, it's more getting the, the right conditions, the, the, the right incentives, the right resources in the right hands, uh, and then sort of like, you do have to hope for, for, for success and, and, and innovation to happen. It's not something I believe you can, you can plan for. No, many uh, fallen uh, go governmental structures already tried to plan everything and uh, it didn't work out very well. Okay, um, so you think that a, a coordinating Latin American plan is, is hard to get and um, that uh, companies, it's not clear the role that they can play there? So the, the, I think com companies do play a role in, in when you have decentralization and, and more sort of like market driven uh, dynamics. Obviously, the, the, the incentives and, and the ecosystem can be, uh, like, companies are part of, of, of that ecosystem. No? I think my, my, my point is that, that I don't think anyone should be responsible for uh, making that plan, not, not the government and not uh, a company. So it's better not to have the plan? <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you it was a tough question. Uh, <laughs> So a, a quote from, from President Eisenhower, that I, uh, from Dwight Eisenhower, or he was a general, not a president, I believe, actually. President, president too. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Um, he said that in the battlefield, plans are useless, but the act of planning is indispensable. Uh, so yes, maybe working towards the plan is the, the, the right approach, 
than the the plan itself is something and, and this is a more personal belief something that i don't believe is is, is 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 the right way to to approach it but definitely the the act of planning and getting together and thinking about the different trade-offs and and uh, as i said you, you do need an ecosystem you do need the the incentives to be aligned uh, so so you can make plans to align all of that and and, and to make sure okay. those things are there for for the rest of it to to happen and then replan when your plans doesn't yeah. work don't work <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Plans usually don't work, but yeah. <laughs> okay. If, Thank you. If if I yeah, may, sure. uh, I think I, I get the point of the colleague here. Like, um, but to some degree, I think there's merit uh, not on, in over planning because I agree. I've seen too much of those things in Latin America. But to some degree, on setting common objectives, a common agenda. Uh, it's like you know, as they say in Japan, like you you want to go to Mount Fuji. You just don't know exactly which path you will follow. But we all want to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's part of the thing missing to some degree in Latin America. Uh, and this is something we might get to agree on. Where do we want to get? Uh, and I think that's a merit uh, to having this, actually these kind of conversations, like uh, you know, between governments, business, civil society. Well, this is, this is our vision, let's say. Uh, you know, as Mr. De Freitas, who is very brave to use this T-shirt in, in this place, uh, <laughs> uh, was telling me he has a vision of, you know, uh, you know going to space, uh, getting robots ready to do that. And to some degree, we might share that. Uh, but the issue there is, like, uh, to specify a bit more of that vision. And maybe in the present time, uh, how do we kind of ensure that, you know, our natural resources are you know, properly used and properly aligned and, and secure for the next generations coming after us. Um, and, and, and these kind of dialogues, uh, yes, I agree that we, we don't need to over plan because God knows we have seen a lot of failure in the past, but also like a shared vision of where to go, uh, I think that might be useful. And I think you were also getting there as well, <laughs> but <laughs> just in case. Um, so I have one last question from the public uh, that I think is for Jocelyn. Uh, you've already given uh, a lot of career advice, but they are asking for more. <laughs> so if you have any last practical advice to have a better career. Okay, so advice for career. Yeah. Mm. Um, you already said to keep organizing Kipu, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to keep going to Kipu. <laughs> yeah, going to Kipu. Um, <laughs> exercise, I find very nice. <laughs> like, I don't know, like I study physics. Um, so I, I used to believe that um, like the whole part, of, I mean, the most important part of me was the brain and something that was behind was just keeping um, the brain up, you know? <laughs> and I have paid for that. <laughs> So now I, when I, I have 37 and I'm super good at sport, like I, I don't believe like, I mean, I don't look maybe like a sporty person, but I really enjoy it. Like I find myself when I'm, I do this hot yoga that is 42 degrees, 90 minutes. And I love it because I, at some moment I start feeling like a piece of meat and, and bones and like it's all sweat and I don't, I don't have to think, I have to just survive. And I, and I enjoy a lot that feeling of like, I'm not a brain, I'm just body, I'm just body. Um, so I will say that, and, and, and you may think like, but come on, like, no, you have to work, you have to write papers. But what I have seen in academia is that I have seen like cases where people like just focus on the career and then they start treating the lab as they will be a family. Have you noticed that? I mean, like I have a friend in France that they have to like make a, a trial against the lab, like the, 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 the leader of the group, because she was like really sick and, and treating them like they will be kids and they will, they will be punishing and things like that. So I think it's very, it's actually, it's an investment in your career to have something outside your career and keep your body and your minds uh, like safe. And also because then you arrive on Monday and you have like something like fresh uh, to do. So I, I will say then like try to, to understand what you are when you are not an academic or like a, like a student or whatever. Keep that, keep that feeling because then when there is a rejection, it's not, it's the paper that is being rejected and it's not you. It's not your self-esteem. And also have your physical body going on. 
uh, and also like your like the people that you love like love them you know like keep your if you're a woman female friends are, are exceptional and also like male friends okay they are good too <laughs> so I will say that that's that's my advice thank you very much I think that's great advice <laughs> I like that just being a body not a mind um, so I just wanted to close up uh, with some challenges that have already been mentioned here. Uh, first, um, um, here, uh, Peter mentioned that, uh, that universities don't need to build skyscraper, right? We don't need so much money as companies that build huge things uh, use. Uh, but you wouldn't believe the little money that Latin American researchers have. So uh, even coming here is, is really very expensive for, for students and also for researchers, uh, even though, I mean, mo many expenses are already covered by Kipu and by our generous sponsors that, that understand that uh, in order to organize an event like this, we need a lot of support. Um, so, um, Kipu is, is working towards improving this uh, by bringing us together today. Um, and, and also, so that's one of the challenges. I mean, money, basically, for, Latin, for, for researchers and for students in Latin America. Uh, we are really underfunded. Uh, there are slightly different situations between countries, but in general, it's, it's a common problem that we have. And I remember in, in Kipo 2019, when I said, uh, yes, uh, we know we should publish in international conferences, but they are too expensive. And how many of you do feel identified with that? And the whole room was like... <laughs> so um, that's one of the barriers. The other barrier was already mentioned, the language barriers. We still need to, to improve and to think how to better organize uh, our logistics so that Latin American researchers can shine on the stage uh, and show their full potential uh, by speaking their own languages, um, our own languages. Um, also, I wanted to end by mentioning that um, I wish uh, our sponsors also consider uh, collaborations with, uh, with us, Latin American researchers, and that our governments, when they have a problem and, and they want to use artificial intelligence, they don't go to the global north to look for, for that knowledge. But they remember they have researchers, uh, local researchers, and also the companies here. Um, so. Latin American researchers dream, uh, we Latin American researchers dream, to have a more diverse artificial intelligence whose main driving force is not extracting data from Latin America, but encourages technological and economic development in our countries so that our people can live better lives. Let's do this together with all this amazing advice. Uh, Now, to close this amazing kipu, we will hear some words from Federico Lecumberri, alias Fefo, that he promised they will be very short. <laughs> okay. So we can already go. What a week, huh? Uh, we are running a bit low of power here, so I'm going to read the closing words we have to, to say tonight, today. We are closing today's event, and that is the end of an awesome, intense, and enjoyable week of lectures, research talks, music, friendship, and future collaborations in AI. This is the first time we are holding an event like the one we had here today, 
Our goal was to open the doors to the community and the general public to grow awareness around how AI can benefit Latin America. We are very happy to be able to have this event here at the Teatro Solis. And we hope we have managed to do this through, through all the amazing talks and discussion we have heard today. It's been amazing to watch our community grow since 2019 and to get to know so many of you and to hear about your research, studies and work in the field of AI. We want to take this opportunity to share a few of these journeys from people in our Kipu community. For example, Paula Martine, Martinez attended Kipu in 2019 and then she went on to found the startup Marvic that now, in 2023, decided to contribute to Kipu as a sponsor. Luciana Benotti, Luciana and Enzo Ferrantes, applause for Enzo too. <laughs> Luciana and Enzo were speakers in Kipu 2019 and today are key members of our organization committee. Without them, this event wouldn't have been possible. Quoting Luciana, there is a story before Kipu and a story after Kipu. The same way, many people sitting here today will surely be hosting soon a future Kipu. Johan Obando attended Kipu in 2019 too, and at the event started a collaboration with one of our speakers, Pablo Samuel Castro, which led to a paper that was published in one of the top, top conferences of AI in the world. These stories reflect how luckily we are to have amazing people in the Kipu community. We are excited to see what this community continues to achieve. We can end this event without thanking all of the people, institutions and companies who have support and believe us to hold Kipu here in Montevideo once again. First, first thanks to the generous support of Intendencia de Montevideo and Teatro Solís. Yes. We also want to say a huge thank you to Universidad de la República and Facultad de Ingeniería. <laughs> to Universidad de la República and Facultad de Ingeniería for their immense support without which Kipo wouldn't be possible. We want to thank our sponsors and partners for all their generous contributions. This support enables us to provide financial help to students who wouldn't be able to be here otherwise. <laughs> Thank you to the Kipu students who have been so engaged in the workshops and lectures, bringing brilliant questions and insights to the sessions. Thank you to the speakers who were so generous with their time and resources, traveled from far and were so open to interact with the students. And thank you to all of the people that in one way or another collaborate to make Kipu 2023 the best Kipu yet. <laughs> However, there is one extra special thank, thank you to our secretary, Easy Planners, and in particular to Pablo Ferrari, for whom no detail is too small, and at this point we consider him as another organizer. Last but not least, we want to thank all of you here tonight. Thank you very much. We hope to see you all for the next edition of Kipu. Thank you. Now we have some drinks and food outside, so we have some time for networking and abrindis. Thank you. <laughs> All the Kipu organizers, please stay in the room. The other